Hello everybody, welcome to the Dry Dock episode 245. This is of course the Patreon Dry Dock for the end of April, so it's going to last a little bit longer than usual, but nonetheless, let's get on with questions. Trevor Polasek asks, what's your favourite ship design that you've created in Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts? I'd say it probably has to be this one. So those of you who've been watching the Dry Dock for a while will recognise this. This is my version of an all-forward design HMS hood. And this is part of a series of designs I put in Ultimate Animal Dreadnoughts that I like to call my all forward triple timeline. So the theory behind it goes that rather than adopting all forward triple turret layouts in the 1920s, uh, partially with the G3 and N3 program, and then obviously with the Nelsons, in this timeline, when the Royal Navy is told, okay, well, the QEs were nice and all, but they were a bit expensive, so we want a slightly cheaper version. And obviously, in reality, that leads to the R-Class. In this reality, some bright spark in the Royal Navy realises that, well, if we're going to have to make these things smaller, and therefore we want to save as much weight and as much space as possible so that they'll be cheaper, well, what if we put all the armament forward? And obviously, if you put four turrets forward that's going to result in an implausibly long uh, bow so we don't want that so for a battleship well, we want to retain at least eight guns well what if we use triple turrets so then the r class end up having three triples kind of like this actually but on a much shorter platform all up front so the r class essentially become a, a slow version of f2 f3 um, and obviously much reduced as well. <laughs> so they essentially are 15-inch Nelsons, but on a smaller scale. And everybody thinks, oh, you know, this is really efficient. We've got one more gun than the Queen Elizabeth so on a much smaller, much cheaper frame. Uh, okay, it's a bit slower, but what can we do with this? And then, obviously, because the R's are now designed with all forward armament, when it comes to designing Renown and Repulse, instead of the historical complete reworking that they had which just took off an aft twin turret in this universe the renown and repulse have two triples up front so effectively the third turret you can see they're the one that's set back again behind b turret that's removed and they just have two triples up front kind of like a, a cut down mini richelieu and then when it comes to hood well, you know, hood's going to be big, it's going to be expensive, it needs to be fast. So what's the best way of doing that? Well, again, concentrate all the machinery aft, all the guns forward, minimize your citadel area, maximize your return on investment, and you get the all forward hood. And thus continues the trend of the Royal Navy all through in this timeline, uh, most of the rest of battleship history. So, and I, I think personally it looks quite nice. I, I can understand where some people's objections to Nelson and Rodney come from. I don't necessarily share them, but I think this version, because obviously you've got to have a much longer aft section to accommodate the machinery, it, it counterbalances some of the objections that people would have to Nelson and Rodney. At least that's my theory. Cisco fan asks, how much work is required to convert from coal burning to oil? Does the entire machinery and steam piping need to be replaced or just the boilers and bunkers? Well, it depends what you're trying to do with it. But uh, to say just the boilers and bunkers, that's still a huge, huge amount. Because as you can see here, I mean, this is uh, Thunderer's boiler room after an explosion. But it gives you a good idea of what a coal-fired boiler is or at least one type of coal-fired boiler actually looks like. So obviously the entire boiler needs to go. That's out of the question. You cannot keep a coal-fired boiler because, well, you can see you've got the grates at the bottom for stacking the coals. Well, you're not going to be using that method anymore. Spraying the oil is completely different. You can't have an open grate when you're spraying oil. Um, so the entire boiler machinery needs to be ripped out, which is a major operation for the ship. The bunkers, generally speaking, coal bunkers have to be fairly close to the boilers for obvious reasons. You've got to physically move the coal to the bunkers. You can have more outlying bunkers, but they tend to be essentially auxiliary or backup bunkers where when you're steaming at low speeds, somebody or some group of somebodies who are very unlucky have to go and manually transfer all of that coal to the nearer bunkers when it can then be transferred into the boilers themselves. That did lead to some controversy with some ship designs 
where they actually had relatively minimal coal bunkerage within their citadel and a significant amount of coal which was stored outside the citadel and it was pointed out well in combat your endurance is now limited to whatever you've got inside the citadel because you're not really going to be opening and closing bulkheads all the time traipsing back and forth to the bow or the stern of the ship to find more coal but with oil you can do that. You can store oil in all sorts of weird and interesting places because, of course, it's all piped. So it's not just a case of replace the bunkers, replace the boilers. You've also got to completely replace the fuel transportation infrastructure within the ship. You, know, you can't have coal chutes anymore. You've got to have some kind of pipe work and pump system to get the oil to the bunkers. You've then also got to have another pump and pipe system to get the oil from the bunkers to the boilers. And then when it comes to, do you need to replace the machinery, the, i.e. the vertical triple expansion engines or the turbines and the steam piping? That's a little bit of an open question because, of course, if you replace like with like, so you have a certain square footage and tonnage of coal-fired uh, fire, boilers and you replace them with oil-fired, you're probably going to have a significant increase in power output. If you have that you're probably going to need to replace the steam piping and possibly the machinery, depending on exactly how much of a jump that is in terms of power. Alternatively, if you only want a modest power increase, something that's within the tolerances of your existing steam pipe and engine tolerances, then you could probably get away without much work to the seam piping. There will still be some because the inputs and outputs will be very slightly different, but you can probably get away with leaving most of your steam work and your engines in place as long as you're putting in roughly the same amount of power or a little bit more, which of course is going to lead to a smaller boiler power plant, which in turn is going to mean rebalancing the ship and deciding what to do with all the extra spare space. So there's there's a fair bit involved. Brian Smith asks, if the Japanese hadn't moved down the Solomon Island chain and stayed in Rabaul and instead focused on New Guinea, what do you think the plans for the US would have been when starting their offensive? Would they have started the Central Pacific campaign early, helped out MacArthur or something else? Well, if the Japanese are turtling up at Rabaul, well, we already know what the US Navy's thoughts on MacArthur's plan to go straight after Rabaul in mid-1942 were, so they're definitely not going to be doing that. But without the Japanese extending their hold further down towards Guadalcanal, I think you're still at some point in 1942 going to see the US landing on Guadalcanal. Obviously, it's not going to be a contested island if the Japanese aren't advancing down that far, but it is a very obvious threat to supply lines to and from Australia, which means that the US will want to secure it as soon as they are humanly able to do, which will probably you know a couple of months later than they did historically because they don't have to rush. At which point, I guess yeah, the thing is a lot of it involves the land campaign side of things, which is not my forte. I would suspect that if that's the case. You'll probably see the naval element maybe conducting carrier raids on Rabaul to try and whittle down the strength of the Japanese ships that are based there. The Japanese, if they're not going further south with their fleet, or southeast, I guess, would probably be using Rabaul as a base for raiding, uh, you know, cruiser, maybe even carrier formations launching raids into the, well, what the US has designated the Central Pacific area or Southwest Pacific area. Um, and that in turn is going to, you know, possibly lead to some confrontations on the high seas, Not maybe not quite on the scale of the Battle of Coral Sea, but um, something like that, maybe like cruiser groups clashing and things such as this. And if the Japanese are mainly focusing their attention on uh, New Guinea, then, well, that's going to be the main focus, isn't it? If if the if the, all the Japanese troops that would historically have gone to Guadalcanal are instead on New Guinea, then the Allies are going to have to correspondingly up their presence on New Guinea, and the the fighting's going to revolve mostly around there with this kind of raiding naval action. Both the U.S. trying to raid Rabaul and the Rabaul-based Japanese forces trying to raid Allied supply lines, occurring just to the east. 
which given the overall size of New Guinea and the increasing numbers of troops, increased numbers of troops involved, that's probably then going to become the central focus of things for a good while until, of course, one way or the other when that's decided and then everything can start moving up and up. But it would also mean, interestingly enough, that as and when the New Guinea situation is resolved, you kind of have US forces based to the south in Australia coming in from the east from Pearl Harbor and so forth, and also now coming from the west in theory from New Guinea for Rabaul and the other northern air held areas of the Solomon Islands, which the Japanese are not going to appreciate. Lieutenant William Bush asks, a YouTube clip noted at Trafalgar, HMS Victory had 31 ships boys on the muster list. Did these very young men have any prospects before eventually growing old enough and big enough to become able seamen, i.e. did they have a chance to be apprenticed to one of the ship's specialists or perhaps be noticed by the captain and rated as a midshipman? There were a variety of prospects. Now, of course, midshipmen could be pretty young on ships, but there were sometimes boys who were eligible to become midshipmen slightly later in life who had been allowed to volunteer for the Navy early. So you could have 10 or 11 year olds running around. Fortunately, nobody in the Navy was dumb enough to think that grown sailors would take orders from 10 or 11 year olds. And so these prospective future midshipmen would be rated as ship's boys and it would essentially allow them to get some additional sea service time in and also get a little bit of pay in their pockets or in their parents' pockets or someone's pockets at least until they became old enough to be officially midshipmen. And from there, they could climb the ranks as per a usual midshipman, except they'd have the advantage of several years sea service time, which doesn't just help with seniority if it's recorded properly, but it also helps with just the fact they know more. If you've joined the Navy at 10 or 11, you'll know more than someone who's joined the Navy at 14 by the time both of you are, say, 16. The other element which makes up a lot of the ship's boys, and bear in mind you can have the cabin boys, you can have the powder monkeys, etc., um, would be very poor uh, or orphans or people who've run away to the Navy, people with otherwise fairly poor prospects. And for them, weirdly enough, actually their prospects, would, if they survived, would usually actually be fairly good. Uh, as you mentioned, if, as they get old enough, they might become able seamen, but much like the boys that are eventually destined to become midshipmen by default, they will have a significant advantage in experience by the time they get old enough to be rated properly. Plus, as you said, yet they might be noticed by a particularly benevolent captain who might decide, well, actually, this, this boy has potential, so we're going to move him over to being a midshipman, although that's relatively rare, but it did happen. And uh, whilst, obviously, Powder Monkey is a job in battle, um, a lot of the ship's boys would because they're physically too small at, you know, 10, 11, 12, to do too much of any great import, uh, things like serving guns and so forth, you would quite often see them being used either as servants to the captain, maybe the uh, first lieutenant, first officer or executive officer, depending on which navy you're in. And also very often they'd end up helping out and this may then drift into an apprenticeship with one of the more specialist crewmen aboard so carpenters surgeons uh, sail makers if you've got one uh, that kind of thing and so they could potentially move on to becoming a sailing master the master of the ship uh, which is a, or basically the highest rank non-commissioned rank that you can get in the navy for much of the age of sail um, they because of their experience might be able to achieve other sort of petty officer ranks fairly quickly relative to people who join later and they might pick up one or more skilled trades you know navigate navigation's another thing that they might pick up quite early in life and if they're starting out that early and i know it sounds really weird to us these days say oh yeah well you know your prospects are really good if you join the navy at 10 but the simple fact of the matter is that yeah if if someone joins the navy at 16 and they're competing at age 20 with someone who's joined the navy at 10 well that person has 10 years experience of what they're doing the other guy has four years experience chances are the guy who's been around for 10 years probably knows significantly more about significantly more different things so you could have 
somebody who's actually you know, still maybe only just approaching 20, but might have a reasonable hand at how to navigate the ship, how to stand watch, how to do basic carpentry repairs, and so on and so forth. And not only does that stand them in good position or good stead to potentially later leaving the Navy, becoming a captain in the Merchant Navy, or, as I said, becoming the uh, a master of a ship, but if they've saved well and if they've got a benevolent officer or so on and so forth, they may also, like the uh, people who might be advanced to midshipmen earlier, they might also then be able to transfer over to command routes. And there's a surprisingly long list of admirals in the Royal Navy throughout its Age of Sail history who started their careers as some form of ship's boy. Meatwad asks, how did World War II navies adapt to losing access to certain resources needed for their ships, such as metals, fuels, etc.? Or did some fail to adapt? Did they settle for lower quality or quantity? It depends a lot on what exactly they were running short of. So if you're running short of particular, I wouldn't necessarily call them trace elements, but elements or materials which you need in relatively small quantities but which are relatively vital so uh, materials to make good ball bearings or other wearable parts of, of a vessel um, maybe components for radar etc then there are various ways of going about it you can just accept a lower quality of material on the understanding that that thing is either going to be slightly less capable or it's going to wear out and break sooner and then you just have to have spares on hand if indeed that element can afford to break and then be replaced obviously if it's going to break and completely freeze up a vital part of the ship then you have to go for the whatever it is that uh, is the higher quality material and if you don't have it, then you're just going to have to settle for not having the whole system at all. If it's more basic, like let's say you want to build half a million tons of shipping that year and you're only producing 400,000 tons of steel, well, then you have a bit more of a problem. Then you have to start allocating resources. And generally speaking, it's these more basic material shortages both in construction and in things like fuel, that confronted navies because whilst it was hard for some navies to get hold of certain uh, of the more exotic materials, the simple fact is that most ships get built over a time scale where if you can't get some extra chromium or molybdenum this month, well, you might be able to get it next month or the month after that. And that particular component of the ship will just have to be manufactured a little bit later. It's somewhat different from compared to aircraft and tanks, where, you know, if you don't have the correct materials, then maybe tanks just flat out don't get built that month or something like that. Um, but for the, for the grander scale things, some nations just went, well, I guess we, we just can't build as much as we wanted to. Um, other nations adapted in various ways. So the US, for example, when they were confronted with a steel shortage, some ships, like the Alaskas they and the Essexes and the Iowas, they absolutely needed high-quality steel. So if you have a shortage of high-quality steel, you have to decide which is the more important of these ships to continue construction. And you continue on those and you pause the others until you've got more steel available. But at, down at the lower end of things, when you're talking about things like transportation craft, then there are options of building them out of lower quality steel, or if just absolute steel shortage is, as opposed to higher quality steel is the problem, then you can even use really low grade rebar and concrete and build concrete barges. You know, those are options that are open to you. Um, with fuel, it's, it's a little bit different because without fuel, ship no go. <laughs> and that's not really something you can get around especially once you are as in world war ii pretty much talking about oil fired warships if you physically don't have the oil you can't do the operations and so navies would then if they were facing serious oil fuel shortages would have to either save up their oil for very specific missions so this is one of the things you see happening in norway and the arctic I'm sure the Kriegsmarine would have loved to sortie 
Admiral Scheer and Lutzow and Scharnhorst and Hipper and Prince Eugen and Tirpitz all together. But by 43, 44, I mean, obviously after 43, Scharnhorst wasn't there anymore. But, you know, in the 43 to 45 time period, regardless of what mixture of ships they've got up there, the Kriegs Arena just flat out doesn't have the fuel stocks to fuel up every single major surface warship plus a destroyer escort and then send it all out. And if they sit around and wait for enough fuel to build up, it's kind of a one and done deal. You get this mission. And if this mission doesn't result in absolutely spectacular success, you're not doing anything again for months and months and months. Um, which explains some of the inactivity of some of the German ships up in Norway. Uh, whereas if you're the Japanese, they eventually would run into similar issues, but they tried to forestall those because obviously part of the problem is a, not just a lack of access to oil itself, but a lack of access to refineries to process that. And not that bunker fuel is particularly heavily processed, but it's more processed than straight out of the ground. But at one point, you know, the Japanese just sort of looked around and went, you know what? It's better to somewhat ruin our engines running on basically the pure output of the Dutch oil fields without much in the way of refining than it is to not run at all. Uh, that only lasted for a certain amount of time while they still had access to them, but it was a way of staving it off. So, yeah, when it comes to ships, there's not a huge amount of adaptation and coping you can really do because when you're talking about shortages for resources that you need to build or run the ships, it tends to be a rather binary choice. You either do or you don't. There are, there are a few little workarounds, as I like concrete ships or accepting really low quality fuel, but by and large, it's just a case of priorities. If you can only build X amount of materials and you want Y numbers of ships, well, you have to decide, well, I'm not getting Y ships, I'm going to get X ships, and which ones are my priority. Um, it's the same kind of thing at a slightly higher end of manufacturing that the British faced with battleships. The British could build a good or manufacture more than enough steel. They could build more than enough hulls. They had more than enough slipways to build loads and loads and loads of battleships, even after the dramatic cuts in shipyard capacity that had occurred during the interwar period. They could lay down on paper a lot of capital ships. The big problems they faced were skilled manpower to construct them, which is one of the reasons why Vanguard was so delayed, because they decided to prioritize implacable, and the shipyard didn't have the manpower to do implacable and Vanguard at the same time at full speed. And the other problem was armor and gun manufacture. So, you know, in theory, if they'd recruited and trained up enough men, which they could potentially have done in the run-up in the 1930s, in theory, they could have run the shipyards in such a way that they built three of the Lion class and one Vanguard each year. So, you know, they, instead of doing two, two, and two, as they planned, they could have done three and three Lions one year and the other year with a Vanguard each year as well. So four capital ships a year. They absolutely with the manpower, with recruiting enough men for the shipyards, could have built those. But then you would have eight hulls sitting in the water and you could only outfit a portion of those with guns and armour, at which point the other hulls are sitting there quietly rotting away. So you just have to acknowledge that you can't build as many ships. Patrick Donnelly asks, How would the US Navy have reacted if USS Hornet was captured by the Imperial Japanese Navy at the Battle of Santa Cruz? Well, I don't think it needs to be said much more than badly. Uh, I mean, the theory in which Hornet could have been catched by the Japanese Navy, I suppose you could either argue that when the US Navy attempted to scuttle Hornet, maybe the torpedoes just flat out didn't work, as opposed to most of them not working, and the five-inch shells have a really high dud rate for some reason. Or alternatively, maybe people believe that actually, you know what, she's probably going down anyway, so the whole scuttling effort's not needed. Bas basically, in some way, shape or form, when she drifts into contact with the Japanese ships, she's not in as bad a state as she was historically. Now, even so, she's still going to be in a pretty bad state, having you know been abandoned and because the Japanese have put a bunch of aerial torpedoes and bombs into her and so on and so forth. Once the US gets word that, hey, Hornet is under tow and heading back for presumably a first rebel, 
I think there will be an all hands on deck effort to make sure she doesn't get there. And to be fair, that tow is probably going to be fairly slow. So you'll probably see a bunch of recon flights trying to find her. And then if they do find her, you'll probably see the US carriers scrape together one last big push to try and make sure she really does go to the bottom. And at the same time, you'll probably have US Army Air Force bombers and US Navy submarines, etc., all being thrown into a gauntlet. The submarines will try and intercept her further north if the bombers and the carrier aircraft don't get her first. But I, I suspect that essentially until they get out of range of US strike aircraft, even Henderson Field is obviously going to get involved, the US armed forces are going to do their level best to make sure that Hornet does not reach Rabaul. And the Japanese, of course, will be trying to loot everything they possibly can that looks sensitive or important as soon as they get hold of the ship. And then it's kind of a sliding scale as to what happens after that. You know, does the US manage to put Hornet down somewhere between the site of her capture and Rabaul? Or does it all fail? You know, do they not find her? Do they not find her in time? Do the attacks get beaten off? Or do they just not actually score any meaningful hits? I think once Hornet gets to Rabaul, there's precious little the US can do about it. They could try and launch a mass carrier strike on Rabaul to try and put her down, but the Japanese, if they've got any sense, will have put her in fairly shallow water, so even if she does sink, she's not going anywhere particularly quickly. And then at some point the Japanese will patch her up to an extent that they think they can take her off to mainland Japan. I don't think they'll bring her back into service as a Japanese carrier. I think that the technology differences are probably a bit too much. They might use her as a training carrier and a source of intel, though. Um, who knows, maybe they might get desperate late in the war. But Hornet, as soon as the US has assets able to reach Japan, Hornet will become a priority target number one. Vokir asks, how much comparative say did Hitler, Mussolini and Stalin have in their nation's naval procurement? Now, whilst I do tend to look at, to a certain degree, what influence political figures have on naval procurement, part of that is helped by the fact that when it comes to uh, British or American or even to a certain extent Japanese records, um, French records, etc., a lot of it is fairly well documented as opposed to um, how exactly Hitler and Mussolini influenced the navies. It is documented. People have written about it. I just haven't looked into it quite as much. But with that caveat in mind, the impression I get is that of the three, I mean, all of them had considerably more say in their nation's naval procurement than, say, Churchill or um, Roosevelt, etc., etc., um, but of the three in question, I think Mussolini seems to have had the least say. Um, he certainly liked the Navy. He wanted the Navy. But in terms of, you know, we are going to buy exactly this ship with exactly this number of weapons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, he seems to have been the least interfering, at least by my reading. Hitler seems to have been a little bit more active in deciding what kind of craft the Kriegsmarine should have. Um, certainly his admirals later seem to have expressed a certain amount of dissatisfaction as to Hitler guy saying, no, you can't have this, I want this, um, which seems a little bit more stuck in the Mussolini. But again, for the most part, I don't get the impression Hitler was sitting there with blueprints for the Scharnhorsts and going, ah, yes, well, we will have these guns exactly here, here, and here. And then you get to Stalin. Uh, and yes, yeah, Stalin... <sighs> Stalin is the most interfering of the lot. Stalin has to approve everything. Stalin has to make suggestions on the designs of everything. And Stalin may change his mind and cause you to completely rework the design midway through construction because Stalin is Stalin. And if you don't do what Stalin says, then you will either be shot or you'll be sent to Gulag or you'll be shot and then your body will be sent to Gulag. Um, but yeah, so Stalin liked to think he knew how to build a navy and for the most part, didn't, as is kind of seen by the fact that when he died, uh, basically everything that he'd personally mandated and forced the Soviet Union to build very quickly went by the way of the scrappers. Robert Henry Ilston asks, in Dry Dock 236, you mentioned how Age of Sail ships had no issues with vision from the quote-unquote bridge looking past one or more masts. 
My understanding of sailing with more than one mast is that it would seem the most efficient way is not to direct sail directly parallel with the wind because your aftmost sails interfere with those towards the bow, intercepting the wind. Well, it's not so much no issues as significantly fewer issues if you go aboard um, something like Victory, at, well, when she's not covered in scaffolding and tentage, um, even something like Constitution to a certain degree. If you're standing where the ship's wheel is, and certainly on something like Victory on the quarter deck, then seeing past the sails and then forward to past the ship is not particularly difficult. Um, and especially when you compare that to later ships, like something like a later class like Trincomalee or Unicorn, um, or certainly Warrior, so anything with really high gunnels, and especially when they go all the way around the bow, then suddenly it becomes much harder to see. Now, yes... Sailing directly dead with the wind could have some issues. Um, I mean, they had a fair bit of time to work out with Age of Sail warships how to minimise the effect of your aftmost sails, in that case, blocking the wind from your foremost sails. So if the wind was going properly strong, um, you would still generally be fine. Uh, you might have a, a very slight loss of efficiency, but... The the layout of Age of Sail ships was optimised to catch the wind as much as they possibly could using the mostly square rig that they tended to have. Obviously, there were some fore and aft sails as well. But the other thing you have to bear in mind when you're talking about large Age of Sail warships is that just because your sails aren't necessarily going to be aligned dead fore and aft doesn't mean that your ship isn't moving in. I mean, the thing is, the ship's always going to be moving in X direction. Uh, for hopefully forward, which means the mast is going to get in the way. But if the wind is coming from, say, 20 degrees behind you to port, you can still be going in a specific direction because the yard arms, the, you know, the horizontal bits that the sails are connected to, those can rotate. So they can rotate to catch the wind properly, but because of the shape of the ship's hull, and obviously the force is being transmitted to the ship's hull, you're basically going to be going in, roughly speaking, a straight line dead ahead, even if your sails are somewhat offset um, relative to you know where you might think they classically should be, i.e. perpendicular to the line of the hull. And so you're still going to have the same issues with visibility when you're at either the steering position or on the quarter deck looking forward, regardless of what exact angle your sails are at. Only in somewhat of the more extreme circumstances of sailing an age of sail, ship of the line, are you going to end up in a situation where the wind is coming in from such an offset relative to your sails that your ship is kind of crabbing partly sideways and then you're looking off to the port or starboard bow to see where you're actually going. Brian Stevens asks, how did American carriers perform in covering Operation Torch as opposed to later actions in the Pacific? Torch is a little bit of a weird one because you've got the four Sangamons plus Ranger and you have this, this slightly bizarre mix of opposition because unlike when they're going into the Pacific, the American pilots initially don't face that much opposition, but the opposition ramps up as the battle goes on. Whereas obviously facing off against the Japanese in the Pacific, they're kind of in your face from day one. Plus you have, unlike sort of the latter part of the Pacific campaign, a lot of experienced French pilots, but in aircraft that are usually a step or two behind what the US is flying. Whereas in the Pacific, the US pilots are generally facing aircraft that are maybe half a step behind them, but might also have a number of performance advantages in certain regimens. But the overall pilot quality is less, whereas in Operation Torch, a lot of the US pilots, although they had a fair degree of fl flying hours, are relatively inexperienced in wartime operations, whereas as the, a lot of the French pilots had some combat experience, um, possibly even a fair bit of combat experience from fighting the Germans during the fall of France. So it is a very different scenario. With that said, the US carriers performed fairly well. Most of their strike missions performed something, either they performed their objective or something close to their objective. Um, they got a fairly decent air-to-air -air kill ratio. I think it was something like four to one in favor of the Wildcats. 
but there were quite a number of operational losses. You know, operational losses, i.e. aircraft running out of fuel, aircraft botching their landings, that kind of thing, um, or aircraft just damaged beyond repair, that vastly exceeded combat losses, which I think reflects the fact that you have a, a relatively inexperienced air group going around. So overall, their, the American carrier performance is fairly creditable. Um, a pre- they did a pretty good job. But they overall, between combat and operational losses, they came away with relatively high levels of attrition to their air group as compared to what you might see in later actions in the Pacific, albeit that they also have a much smaller overall air group available to them than a lot of US operations later on in the Pacific, at which point even a similar number of overall losses will affect the torch air groups significantly more than exactly the same number of aircraft lost would affect, say, a battle group formed of six or seven fleet and light carriers. And to throw extra fun into the mix, you also have the fact that the US forces are trying to operate alongside British forces and some free French forces, and there is a certain degree of land-based air support, which you don't tend to get in the Pacific either. And that did lead to a couple of friendly fire incidents, but which obviously are not so much of a hazard in the Pacific, because for most of the time it's the US Navy only. Um, although you would run into that kind of risk later on once the British Pacific fleet gets properly involved. Dave Collier asks, what can you tell us about the Gallias type ships? Why, when and where were they created and were they successful? The Gallias comes about in the mid 1500s. And as for why, it's basically because gunpowder is becoming more and more predominant as a ship-to-ship weapon um, in the form of obviously cannon and shot. However, in the Mediterranean, most warfare is still conducted with galleys, whereas carracks, which will later evolve into galleons, are becoming more and more prevalent in northern European waters and out in the Atlantic. The problem is when you take some of these bigger sailing-powered only vessels into the Mediterranean, there's quite often periods of calm and and or contrary winds, which make utilising a large, heavy, sail-powered craft somewhat difficult when you've got lots of light light oared vessels that are able to run rings around you and go in whatever direction they want. But the galleys can't carry very many cannon. Galleons and carracks can... And so the Gallius is this kind of compromise. It's a much, much larger version of the galley, in as much as it's very long and thin and has a whole ton of oars stuck to the side. But it takes some themes from what will become galleons as well. So it has a gun deck down each side. Exactly where that gun deck is positioned depends on the illustrations, because unfortunately we don't have any surviving actual galleys, even wrecks in any substantial state of Uh, intactness so some depictions have the oars mounted quite high up and they have to raise the oars to fire the guns which are mounted lower down which makes sense from a stability point of view if not necessarily from a usage point of view and other illustrations have the oars lower down and the gun deck above them which makes more sense from a firepower point of view but would make the ship less stable somewhat similar to galleons which they would serve alongside and uh, be succeeded by they also have a Foxel and a stern castle or an after castle and it, but as you can see being mediterranean ships quite often they're powered by fore and aft sails rather than square sails they also tend to have as well as you know, the standard 1500 zero battery of heavy and light anti-personnel guns with the heavy guns being for anti-ship work galleasses were particularly noted for having some very heavy guns mounted in the bow now those could just be pointed straight forward or on some galleasses, they're illustrated as basically having a half circle, almost wooden, literal wooden castle with heavy guns pointing both to the sides and ahead and at the various angles in between. And the idea of the galleas was that once you'd refined it a little bit to improve its speed, it could just about keep up with the galley fleets, which, as we just said, galleons and so forth really couldn't. It was theoretically able to manoeuvre independent of the wind, the same as the galleys could, but it was much, much larger, so the occasional ramming attack, which was still a thing back then, really wouldn't do anything to it. 
and it because it had gunfire power in all directions because it would also have guns in the stern then any relatively lightly built galley that was approaching it was asking to get destroyed in fairly short order it, at the Battle of Lepanto, galleasses were used and their heavy guns proved capable of basically shattering galleys with single hits, which was quite impressive. And in some forms of amphibious and uh, sea-to-land siege warfare, obviously the fact they could carry some really heavy guns helped with that as well. They were mostly built in the Mediterranean for Mediterranean powers, although as the latest and greatest fashion statement for kings of this period... It also meant you did see some being built in Northern Europe. Henry VIII, for example, and both the French as well would build galleasses. And in the big painting of the French tack on the Solent, which results in the sinking of the Mary Rose, you will actually see both galleys and galleasses on both sides. But the Northern European ones were built in such a way that, in actual fact, a number of them were then converted into galleons by relatively easy means just taking the oars out slightly reworking them and they would go on to be non-oared vessels under conventional sail power now as for whether or not they were successful in the mediterranean yes they were for a good chunk of time once it came to northern european waters however for example the um galleasses there were four of them with the armada they proved somewhat less successful. They were actually able to defend themselves fairly well because of their ability to manoeuvre independent of the wind and the fact they were still relatively large. So approaching English vessels had to be very wary of them. They had a lot of troops aboard, so they couldn't afford to get too close and let the galleys board them. And those heavy guns could do some fairly serious damage, and they had this kind of all-round firepower, which, again, thanks to their oars, they could bring to bear the heaviest guns that they wanted to almost at will. But because they were somewhat more optimised for rowing than they were for anything else, they did suffer in northern European waters, particularly with the weather. So of the four that set out, I believe only two made it back. Uh, one ended up being lost at the Battle of Gravelines, or however you pronounce that, uh, the basically final battle of the Armada campaign. And then the other, La Garona, went down off the coast of Ireland. And essentially they were they became outclassed because although they were very powerful for their time, as the galleon really took hold, it got larger and larger and faster and more seaworthy and was carrying more and more guns. And the galleus, as long as it wanted to retain that ability to be substantially all-powered, just couldn't compete. It, the, the oarsmen and the oars took up too much space. They put too much demands on its hull form and its height. And therefore, galleons just became far too powerful, at which point, once you started to see better sail rigs, which allowed sail-powered only vessels to operate more freely in the Mediterranean, the galleus kind of died out as a hybrid ship that was good for a, a few decades, but then very rapidly became obsoleted because if you wanted something small, fast and quick, you could get a galley or later a frigate that could do the same thing for a lot less. And if you wanted a lot of firepower, well, galleons and later ships of the line could do that, except they could do it a lot better and a lot more. Mike Lima 777 asks, During the Age of Sail, the British captured several French 74 gunners during the mid to late 18th century, and that led to the British adopting the 74 gun third rate. When the British captured the 118-gun Commerce de Marseille, with it being the leadership of what would become the Océan class, did they learn anything useful from the design? And if so, what influences did it have on Royal Navy first rates? It is a little bit weird, because when the British captured French frigates, they were very happy to put them into service. When they captured some big French frigates, they were semi-eager to copy them when the need arose. And as you mentioned, when it came to 74 gunners, they were very happy to copy that idea. And certain elements of the Royal Navy were quite in favour of French 80 gunners when they captured those, the slightly bigger French third rates and so forth. So generally there was, uh, there was a certain degree of enthusiasm in the Royal Navy for, both for incorporating French warships into the fleet and also for building ships either as direct copies of or inspired by French warships that they'd captured. 
But when it comes to first rates, the Royal Navy seems to have been unusually reticent about copying or imitating other nations. But, and I mean, it's not, first rates are relatively hard to capture, but the Royal Navy did end up capturing a few, both French and Spanish. But there doesn't seem to have been any direct correlation to influence on British first rate design, partly because they're so large a project that they're actually very rarely built. So sometimes years can go between the capture of one ship, which itself may be years or decades old, and then actually building one yourself. Plus, there's a lot. there were a lot of arguments over exactly what made the best first rate in terms of utility. Um, so looking at the full-sized first rates, and it gets a bit difficult because there's a bunch of 98-gun second rates that were later upgunned slightly, which are also three-deckers. But what influence was had on them is, again, difficult to chart. But when you look at Wet Commerce de Marseille, the only all-singing, all-dancing, top-of-the-line British ship of the line that was built in about a decade or more afterwards was HMS Caledonia, which was the forerunner of the Caledonia class. Now, she was initially supposed to have been built as a 100-104 gunner. Many Royal Navy first and second rates of this period were built either directly on or inspired by the lines of HMS Victory because HMS Victory was a superb first rate. Um, as far as the British were concerned. So uh, that's where a lot of late 18th, early 19th century British ship of the line construction ideas came from. But Caledonia was ordered the year after Commerce de Marseille was captured. She didn't actually start work until, as I say, almost a decade later because of various delays and so forth. But when she was actually started, instead of being a 100 or 104 gunner, she was then built as a 120 gunner which seems a lot closer to Commerce de Marseille, although, as I said, by that point, Commerce de Marseille had long since left Royal Navy service and been broken up. Um, and Caledonian's lines are still quite heavily influenced by her, the designer's own admission uh, by those of HMS Victory. So I think, if anything, I would say with captured first rates, like Thomas de Marseille, the British seem to take from them, okay, maybe we need to have some more guns on our ships, but they don't seem to have taken any specific design cues from French or Spanish ships of the line, particularly, certainly not to the extent that they did with the third rates and with the frigates. The Rogue Chief asks, if the wreck of Shinano is ever found, assuming the hull didn't suffer the same catastrophic damage while sinking like Musashi and Yamato, what could we potentially extrapolate from her wreck about the Yamato-class design that is still speculation, given the state of her half-sisters and the destruction of many of the original plans? Well, we do have a few more plans than we used to think. Over the past ten years, a few random bits and pieces and a couple of collections have shown up in various places in Japan, but it still there's a fair bit incomplete. Now, if... Shinano's wreck is found, a lot of it's going to depend on how it's landed on the seabed. As you said, there doesn't seem to be any major magazine explosion, but she was in the process of capsizing when she disappeared beneath the waves. The flip side of that is that a lot of ships were seen to be capsizing. When battleships tend to capsize, they usually do end up upside down on the seabed, whereas with aircraft carriers, if you think about some of the ones that are known to have sunk and have subsequently been rediscovered, like, let's say, Lexington, aircraft carriers seem to right themselves on the way down. And this, to a degree, makes a certain amount of sense because, obviously, battleships have a lot of heavy stuff up top, like, you know, the gun batteries, the collective superstructure, and if you're looking at the overall ship center of gravity, the armor deck, and that will kind of flip things and hold things the wrong way around. Whereas aircraft carriers, most of their armor, their engines, etc., all that heavy stuff is down below. The hangar structure is usually fairly light and the superstructure is much smaller than you'd find on a battleship. So it makes sense that they would ride themselves the right way up. So if we assume that Shinano has landed either upright or close to it, the external inspection probably won't tell us 
too much more than what we already know with regards to the Yamato class, bearing in mind that Shinano was a slightly modified version of the Yamato's already anyway, before, of course, she was completely modified into an aircraft carrier. But internally, if she's if she's in good shape, and given the advances in underwater, um, I, well, they're not UAVs because they're not they're the USVs, underwater uh, unmanned subsurface vessels, USSV maybe. Anyway, drones basically. If she's broadly intact, then we could send drones inside and see how far they get. And that would probably tell us a fair bit because, as I said, we have some partial plans, but looking at the internals would be highly informative as, you know, what the actual layout is, what kind of systems were actually aboard her. I mean, it's also a good snapshot of a late war Japanese warship. And it would be interesting to also see exactly what modifications were made to the hull to adapt it for being an aircraft carrier because, you know, two photos and some partial descriptions isn't a huge amount to go on. So we'd, I think we'd learn as much about the conversion process, if not more, um, for turning her into a carrier as we would about the Yamato class itself. But a proper underwater survey would probably give us a, a fair chunk of information that we don't have. Of course, there's always the pie in the sky, if she's completely intact, could she be salvaged? idea um i have no idea how you'd go about that considering her overall displacement but well where there's a will there's a way she's probably in shallow enough water i have no idea what you'd do with the wreck if you did salvage it though and there's not exactly that many dry docks you can stick her in and she does have a couple of rather large holes in the bottom 22NF2 asks, going by total tonnage sunk, which carrier launched aircraft was the most effective out of everything used in the Pacific theatre of World War II? Well, if you want to be really snarky, you could say the swordfish, because technically the swordfish was used in the Pacific theatre, and the swordfish is acknowledged as the carrier aircraft with the highest tonnage of enemy shipping sunk period in World War II. But I get the feeling that you weren't looking for technicalities. You're probably asking, you know, what is the most effective carrier aircraft that actually served most of its career in the Pacific Theater in World War II, i.e. between the Japanese and American carrier-based aircraft. Now, for that, it's somewhat difficult because finding exact figures of which aircraft sank which ships or credited there for is very hard um there are figures that are bandied about such as i mean there's one or two claims that the sbc2 hell diver was the u.s navy carrier aircraft that sank the most tonnage which to a degree is believable because when you look at the number of ships sunk both in europe and in the pacific it ticks up massively in 44 and 45 as the Axis defences collapse. So the fact that the Helldiver is a relatively late arrival to the theatre doesn't necessarily rule out it sinking a huge number of ships. But at the same time, those ships are usually going to be somewhat smaller because that's when the US Navy was pressing in on Japan's coastal trade, finishing off the last of its merchant trade, and a good chunk of the US, sorry, of the Japanese fleet was already on the bottom you also have issues of things like say the sinking of Yamato and Musashi where they were both hit by lots of bombs and lots of torpedoes so does the dive bombers get half the tonnage as credit do the torpedo bombers get half the tonnage as credit do you decide well actually we think the torpedoes had more to do with it than the bombs and give all the credit to the Avengers or vice versa there's a fair number of times when ships were sunk and it involved both dive bombers and torpedo bombers and fighters as well, once they started putting bombs and rockets on Hellcats and so forth. So th that muddies the waters even more. And then, of course, you've got the fact that back towards the beginning of the Pacific Theatre, you have the good old Dauntless and... For example, there are some people who say, oh, well, you know, the Dauntless sank 300,000 tons of enemy shipping. 
but I personally find that somewhat difficult to believe because if you just add up the known kills of the Dauntless of major warships, cruisers, um, capital ships, carriers, um, and destroyers, you're pretty much pushing 300,000 tons or more already before you start counting for transport ships and various other smaller ships that the Dauntless is also sank. So I'm afraid I can't give you a straight answer because I don't know. Um, and if anyone does know and can prove it with statistics and figures, then please let us know because I'd like to know as much as anybody else. Um, I mean, who knows? It could be there could be a black horse in in the race, and the Avenger might come up tops. But I have a suspicion it's probably going to be between the Dauntless getting a big chunk of the Japanese Navy sunk, and then filling it out with a smaller number of lesser vessels, or possibly then the competition being the Helldiver, where it might have sunk a relative handful of the Japanese Navy's major vessels but then filled up with hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of small craft. HMS Inconceivable asks, I was watching a video from Armoured Carriers, and the Royal Australian Navy sailors recalled not having flashless powder for cruisers as late as the Battle of Surigao Strait. This made HMAS Shropshire stand out and get straddled. What was the cause of this lack of capability, and was it wise for the US Navy to al allow Royal Navy or Royal Australian Navy ships to participate in a night action, knowing these deficiencies? Well, all night actions are a risk, so, I mean, obviously, yes, if you have a propellant that's causing significantly more flash than your compatriots, that is a risk, but war is a risk, so... I don't think it's particularly wise or unwise for the US Navy to let British or Australian ships partake, even if they don't have flash propellant for their guns, because ultimately that risk is down to the men aboard that ship, the captain making the decision. And of course, if you want to be completely cynical about it, from a US Navy perspective, a British or Australian ship that's firing with flash with a uh, propellant that has a large amount of flash and you're firing with reduced flash or flashless propellant, depending on exactly what term, more accurate terminology you want to use, um, then, well, the, they're going to draw the fire that otherwise might be directed at you. Now, as far as why Shropshire didn't have flashless propellant, it comes down to essentially cost because remember, the US Navy and the Royal Navy use different types of propellant. And the to make Royal Navy pro propellants of World War II for their big guns, to make them flashless or, again, reduced flash, that was quite an expensive process. The, uh, the chemicals you needed to introduce uh, could only be made using huge amounts of electricity, kind of like making aluminium in some ways. And... As a result, there was a very limited manufacturing capacity for it. It was much, much easier to make standard propellant. And then even if you did make the flashless propellant, then, you know, you've got to store that alongside in your magazines, your regular propellant, because you're not going to be able to produce enough of it um, to completely outfit everybody's magazines, which at that point means you're going to have to have, you know, this is our bit, these are our charges for night actions, and these are the bulk of our charges for regular daytime actions. And how do you divide that up? Uh, because are you know, you're going to use your really expensive charges by accident, or how can you ensure that these particular charges go up the hoists in a night action and they don't get confused with the regular charges? What happens if you run out of <laughs> your flashless charges, etc., etc.? And also, obviously, given the fact that there's only a limited amount of flashless propellant being produced, how do you best divide it up? Because if you put all of that into the dozens or hundreds of pounds that you need for 8-inch or 14-inch, 15 or 16-inch charges, you're going to end up with a very, very few flashless charges for a select number of ships, or you could supply that same amount of propellant to many, many more smaller charges. And that's what the Royal Navy ended up doing. They ended up 
essentially putting flashless propellant into the 5.25s, the 4.7s, the 4.5s, and the 4-inch guns. And the 6-inch guns on the town-class cruisers, Leander, Zarathusas, etc., etc., but nothing bigger than that. And so this is why you also see a similar situation happening at the Battle of North Cape, where Belfast and Sheffield, being 6-inch armed cruisers, have these reduced flash charges, whilst Norfolk, a county-class cruiser with 8-inch guns, which is sailing with it, doesn't have them. And with Shropshire also being a county class, basically the Royal Navy didn't have the manufacturing capacity to give her flashless charges. Donovan Lawler asks, if Somerville manages to stumble over Nagumo and the Kido Butai during the Indian Ocean raid and promptly turns the Kido Butai into so much sunken scrap metal, how does this affect the rest of the Pacific War? Well, it depends on what the extent of the defeat of the Kido Butai is, because you've got to remember that Force A has a couple of E-class, half a dozen destroyers, War Spite, of course, um, with radar, etc., fresh off of Matapan, and two illustrious class aircraft carriers. Force B, granted, does have four Avenge-class battleships and some further escorts, but it's realistically too far behind to make any real odds of things. Whereas uh, Nagumo's forces, he's got three carriers, Akagi, uh, Shikaku, Zuikaku, in one formation, although technically Akagi is Carrier Division 1, the other two are Carrier Division 5, and then Hiryu and Soryu in Carrier Division 2 slightly split off during the period that we're discussing. He also has some destroyers, Tone, Chikuma, and the four Kongos. But as far as anyone can tell, they're all with... Um, the main body with Akagi and the two Shikakus. So there is a relatively plausible argument to be had that if one of the albacores hadn't been shot up by the Zeros, uh, one albacore shot down, the other had its radio shot out. So let's say the one that had its radio shot out, the cannon shells go wide and the radio isn't broken. That would mean that some of all maintains his course, at which point he gets the drop on a pair of essentially unprotected carriers at night, which is the perfect scenario for the Royal Navy because the Japanese carriers can't do night strike and fighting operations. They, the Japanese can do night fighting with their surface ships, but their carriers can't. And obviously he's got radar and experience, and his ships have experience in how to use it. So taking out Hiryu and Soryu, and any ships that might be in the immediate vicinity, that's relatively plausible. Now, that would be a big hit to the Japanese. Um, obviously, if everything else goes, roughly speaking, as historical, that would mean that the Japanese only have Akagi and Kaga to show up with at Midway, which would make a huge difference. And... As I've mentioned before in this scenario, you also have the slightly amusing thing of once Hiryu and Soryu are set on fire, anything that Nagumo sends from his main force to investigate why is the horizon on fire would mean that pretty much all the surface forces, including Warspite, would have to break off and try and skirmish or repel them, which would probably mean that Hiryu and Soryu would be, weirdly enough, finished off by guns from the two illustrious class. So yeah, first carrier versus carrier battle is finished by surface gunfire. That would really put a cat amongst the pigeons. Working out how the entire Kido Butai gets sunk is, yeah, that's a very difficult one to, to pull off plausibly. Because, I mean, Warspite's good, and she does have radar, but taking on giving taking on four Congos at night when the Japanese, as we said, even though they lack radars, are relatively good at night fighting, that's pushing it a bit. Now, if it was just the four Congos versus Force A, you might be able to scrape some kind of really, really unlikely but potential win where the, the crew two cruisers, Emerald and Enterprise, are dumping torpedoes in the water and the destroyers are dumping torpedoes in the water and they get enough hits. I mean, it's probably be close range engagement, so that's somewhat plausible to damage or destroy enough of the Congos that War Spike can finish off the balance. However, <laughs> as I just mentioned, you've also got Tone, Chikamon, a bunch of Japanese destroyers to worry about, so that's not really on the cards. I think, again, although this this element would be 
rather fantastical and highly imaginative, you could potentially make the argument that the ambush of Carrier Division 2 goes off relatively plausibly. Hiryu and Soryu are set on fire and sunk in fairly short order. And then Somerville detecting incoming radar contacts. Maybe, say, Nagumo sends out two Congos and some destroyers to investigate what, what's happening because he wants to keep two Congos and set the rest of the destroyers and the cruisers back to protect his carriers. Um, they detect them coming in on radar. They decide, right, we're going to make tracks, um, maybe dump a spread of torpedoes in the water and retreat. Um, the Japanese ships would obviously initially go to investigate the carriers, their own carriers, that is, see what's happening. And maybe they then retire. Maybe there's a radar equipped ship that's not war spike just hanging off in the distance just keeping an eye on maybe just maybe the visibility is enough that they can keep an eye on the japanese with radar but the japanese can't spot them and then the the japanese forces retire they head back to nagumo you know we know something happened but we couldn't find anything and that gives Somerville a vector to where the rest of the enemy formation is. Now Somerville's in a bit of a state because he knows that potentially there's a lot more enemies out there. And he's not going to get to beyond safe distance by the morning. But since he has a vector, then maybe he can scramble his radar equipped aircraft. Because he did send out radar equipped aircraft um, in the evening to look for the Japanese ships historically to conduct a strike on them but didn't find anything because he'd made course alterations that threw the calculations out. But in this scenario, he knows where, where they should be going. And, you know, he sends off everything he can get from his two carriers. And then again, since we're going into the hyper fantastical, maybe he, they, they managed to get the drop on the Japanese formation. That's not necessarily in and of itself too implausible because that is what the Royal Navy trained for. The slightly more fantastical thing would be that, maybe eight or so swordfish and albacores assigned per carrier not only managed to identify the carriers as a part from the congos but also managed to get drops successfully enough to hit each of the carriers with three or four torpedoes and so you know, 30 to 50 percent success rate of drops and then obviously get away with whatever anti-aircraft fire is going on and this makes the Japanese carriers succumb. I mean, again, you know, if they get hit by three or four torpedoes all down the same side, the Japanese carriers going down isn't necessarily that implausible. Um, but the circumstances that arrive at that are <laughs> you'd be really rolling natural sixes and natural twenties all day. But if that somehow happens, well, the Japanese are a bit stuffed because the only things they've then got to prosecute their war as far as carrier assets go, at least large carrier assets, would be Kaga and then the Hios, Hio and Junyo, and then they're down to Rugio and various other light conversions, which means that things like, well, the Coral Sea, Battle of the Coral Sea is not going to happen because the Japanese aren't going to risk basically their last carriers for that kind of thing, I don't think. Midway is almost certainly not going to happen for similar reasons. At which point, 1942 is probably, after that brief spark of excitement, very much duller. <laughs> um, I, but, yeah. So that that's one way it could go, you know, the 0.1 percentile way of going things. It's much more plausible that Hiryu and Soryu get sunk, and then there's a skirmish following that. Um, but that doesn't put the entire Kido Batai down. Andrew Waite asks, why did the neutrality patrols off the coast of Spain during the Spanish Civil War require the presence of heavyweight units like HMS Hood or HMS Barham? Was this flag-waving show of force by the Royal Navy, or did the belligerents have ships capable of troubling lesser warships? Partly, it was due to the fact simply that the big heavyweights could sit off the coast for a very long time, and were also quite useful as flagship units to coordinate the other ships on neutrality patrols. And they had plenty of resources. You know, they had scout aircraft. They had, as mentioned already, command and control facilities for admirals. They had crew that could supplement other ships or help with checking vessels with boarding actions. And they were pretty intimidating and fairly recognisable, which meant it was much harder for 
the various involved parties to quote unquote accidentally bomb them. Um, but there were also, at least at the start of the Spanish Civil War, a number of Spanish relatively heavyweight units that could have troubled lesser vessels. So there were two Espana class battleships. Admittedly, they are the smallest and weakest of the dreadnoughts, but they are still battleships. If uh, Admittedly, one was on each side, but if one of them had shown up and there was just a heavy cruiser in the way and nothing to back it up, or anything smaller like a light cruiser or some destroyers, then they're still capable of dishing out quite a lot of pain. There's also two Canarias class heavy cruisers, which are based on the counties, which again could in theory have given a heavy cruiser, well, you know, they could give any heavy cruiser a hard time of it, and anything smaller than that, a very hard time of it, albeit that one of them ended up being sunk by a destroyer from the other side, but that's neither here nor there. So at the start, you've got these four heavy units, two heavy cruisers, two battleships, and something like Hood or Barham rocking up, or War Spike for that matter, is just saying, yeah, we don't care what you send out. We are enforcing the terms of this, well, not necessarily blockade, but patrol that we're going, we've chosen to do. By the time the Spanish Civil War ended, um, they'd lost one of the battleships and one of the cruisers, but that's neither here nor there. Alec Ruby asks, You said a very long time ago that larger guns like the 16-inch 50s were practically maxed out lengthwise because if the barrels got any longer, they'd begin to see barrel droop. My question is, was this also something that existed for smaller caliber guns with barrel lengths that would be within reason to be possible? And secondly, I thought the US actually made some 18-inch guns just before the Washington Naval Treaty and then used them to test different shells, and one of them was sleeved down to 16-inch to test super heavy shells, with reference to the big gun talk you had with Ryan on USS New Jersey. So with reference to the 18-inch gun that the US built, yeah, they built one, um, but when I was doing the chat about 18-inch guns with Ryan, we were talking about guns that were made for operational service whereas you know the, so the british did have an 18 inch gun that entered operational service the japanese did the us one was a single prototype that was only ever used for testing now as for the main question in terms of barrel droop yeah i mean there are 52 55 caliber guns out there in world war ii but once you get any significant distance out beyond that you are going to see significant barrel drooping problems significantly greater lengths you're going to have problems just with the sheer weight of it just standing there and with intermediate lengths beyond that you're going to have issues with as the barrels heat up uh, the barrels will start to droop now yes there were things like harp where they extended guns to really stupid lengths but you'll notice that they had to have kind of supports along the gun barrel in order to prevent that kind of flexing now, when it comes to smaller guns, some small guns did get to considerably greater than 55 caliber barrel lengths, but they tended usually not to have the same kind of problems with droop. And that's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, our wonderful friend, the square cube law is back, which means that, you know, if you have, say, an eight inch gun and you cut a one foot section of it and weigh it, and then you get a 16 inch gun, so theoretically double the linear dimension in diameter and you cut one foot section of that and you weigh that you'll find a one foot section of 16 inch gun weighs considerably more than double what the eight inch gun section weighs so if we take the overall length and weight of the typical eight inch gun as found on most u.s navy warships in world war ii and a 16 inch 50 gun as you can see here on uss new jersey a one foot section of a US eight inch gun is going to weigh about 460 kilos, um, which is you know, just under half a ton. Whereas the one, a one foot section of USS New Jersey's gun is going to weigh just over 1.6 tons. So you're talking something in the order of three and a half to four times as much weight instead of double. And obviously, if you have significantly increased mass, that's a significantly increased strain on the steel, which means significantly increased uh, stress and therefore significantly increased chance of drooping. The other thing you have to bear in mind 
is of course that wonderful law of moments because the the gun the, has a pivot point where it's on its cradle so that it can elevate and depress and if you consider you know basic equation of turning moments if that's the point around which the stress is going to be exerted and then you consider the um, let's say the eight inch gun again typical of most US heavy cruisers of the time it's already a 55 caliber weapon but it's a 55 caliber weapon with an overall gun length of 449 inches and a bore length of 440 inches and obviously a little bit less than that for where the from the pivot point where it's mounted on the cradle to the muzzle whereas if you look at a 16 inch 50 that's 800 inches <laughs> so almost double again obviously adjusting a little bit for the point around the pivot so and you're still only at 50 calibers so if you went up to 55 calibers it'd be even further still so even if the weights were the same by the time you get to 50 or 55 calibers the weight is significantly further out on a 16 inch gun which means that because the turning moment is dictated not just by the weight that's being exerted but by the distance from the pivot point that force overall is going to be significantly greater so combine the two and you have significantly more weight at any given point being exerted over a significantly greater distance resulting in a far 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 greater turning moment which means that basically a battleship gun will droop first whereas if you then scale it all down to an 8 inch gun a 6 inch gun or a Bofors 40 mil then not only is the proportional length and and the weight a lot less so there's you're less likely to have drooping anyway but you're also getting much further away from the ultimate tensile strength and the plastic and elastic deformation points of the steel itself and therefore you can make a much longer barrel smaller caliber weapon than you can a larger one assuming you're using the same materials with the same weights and they're still firing something fairly significant glenn Riccafrente asks did the u.s navy fight in a battle line engagement using capital ships i.e ships of the line or battleships prior to surigao strait and if so what were these battles the u.s age of sail ships of the line never got to fight in a battle line against any kind of opposition because they were built after the war of 1812 for the most part apart from one that they built before that they gave to the french and then they were well any survivors were pretty much burned or used as hulks during the american civil war then you've got various ironclads i mean it depends if you class some of the monitors as capital ships or not given the existence of sort of five to 10,000 ton seagoing ironclads at the same time I'd tend to say no that monitors aren't capital ships but if you want to stretch that far then technically there were some line actions between monitors and various confederate ships during the American Civil War but skipping past that because I don't really count that you've I mean the Battle of Santiago de Cuba technically involves at least one or two u.s capital ships uh pre-dreadnoughts obviously and they are technically fighting a very strong outline action and some people at the time thought the armored cruisers which the spanish did have in that battle could be secondary line of battleships so if you really stretch and squint you could call the battle of santiago de cuba a battle line engagement using capital ships at least on one side but it's not a straight up fight between first rate capital ships on both sides for certain and the u.s navy although it came very close to leading the high sea the grand fleet into action against the high seas fleet in 1918 that didn't quite happen so at that point since south dakota really got a little bit uh, out on her own and then shot up during the fight with a kirishima which obviously Washington won, that also technically won't count as a battle line engagement because it was a battle line of one, USS Washington. So yeah, Surigao Strait would be the first and last battle line engagement of the United States Navy that you can properly qualify as there were battleships on both sides and the US Navy was sailing in a formation that vaguely resembled a line. <laughs> 
Chief Eyeroll asks, you've recounted the Royal Navy service of King George VI in the past, but could you talk about William IV's career in the Royal Navy? Was he the first member of the royal family who became the monarch to serve as a career naval officer as both Lord High Admiral and King? Did he make an overall positive or negative contribution to the Royal Navy in his lifetime? So initially, far from the line of succession, the man who would eventually become King William IV served a fairly solid career in the early part of the Royal Navy. He fought at the First Battle of Cape St. Vincent, he fought during the American War of Independence, and he would become an admiral on his own merits, getting up to command a ship of the line. He met and got on quite well with Nelson, uh, but due to various circumstances, including some uh, rather inopportune political statements, he, when he left the Navy briefly during a time of peace at in the seven at the beginning of the 1790s when the napoleonic wars kicked off although he dearly wanted to go back into naval service the admiralty for various reasons never actually recalled him back to the colors so that was the end of his active duty naval career now much later in life he was then made lord high admiral and in that role he actually did a fair bit of good he spearheaded and championed quite a number of reforms both making things better for the men in the navy and also pushing for a variety of technological advancements with his spell as Lord High Admiral being in the 1830s. Now, he wasn't the first person who would eventually become monarch to serve as a career naval officer. There were a number before him. Uh, for example, James II, before he was James II, actually was a remarkably good naval commander. Um, for all the fact that he ended up getting the Stuart dynasty overthrown, he gave pretty decent legitimate service in the well at that point one of the anglo-dutch wars serving under his brother charles ii and william the fourth in his naval career seems to have been held as also a fairly competent naval officer so you know there's there's a history of royal navy officers who are part of the royal family who then go on to become king that does stretch back a fair way texas and la Choc asks where did the name uss robin come from there's been a variety of theories put forward. Um, the idea that you know, a robin is a thing that flies, therefore aircraft carrier, flying aircraft, ha ha ha. Uh, reference to Robin Hood, you know, sneaky, sneaky British carrier operating in, hi in hiding in plain sight and so forth. But um, Robin was the call sign given to Victorious as an attempt to you know, kind of at least ensure some kind of operational signal security, if nothing else. But uh, that and therefore led to people just saying, aha, yes, we are USS Robin, even though she was still officially HMS Victorious. Personally, I think the reason for the allocation of the call sign and then the kind of semi-serious uh, semi adaptation of the title was because there was actually a USS Robin at the time, which was a minesweeper, and it was assigned to the Pacific. So if there was radio communication that was talking about a Robin operating with the fleet, if anybody had any real concern in, on the Japanese side as to what this ship actually was, then they could relatively quickly find out, ah, oh, it's, it's a minesweeper. Well, having a minesweeper attached to the US carrier, such a force such as it is at that point, well, that makes sense. They don't want their carrier to run into mines. So, yeah, they're probably just talking about minesweeping operations in and around where the cat, the US is operating its carriers, which would then deflect attention away from the fact that actually it was another full-sized fleet carrier. So that my personal supposition would be somebody was just trying to play a quick sleight of hand for basic radio security, and the people involved in the HMS Victoria Saratoga operation just took it and ran with it. Michael Gilson asks, I believe it was back at the start of February you answered a question about the feasibility of the Royal Navy using a triple 15-inch turret using the same size barbette as the Royal Navy Twin 15. If such a turret was developed, what do you think of the idea of first using it in the R-Class, say two triples forward and one rear, removing the rear superfiring tar turret to permit larger machinery spaces to maybe bring the speed up to the QEs? So very crudely speaking, we'd be talking about something about this. I mean, I haven't put the secondary batteries on or anything and so forth, but it's approximately an R-Class with triple 15s. 
it's not exact, but I may, I may do with the best of what I could find in terms of superstructures and so forth. Now, I think if this could be perfectly feasible. I mean, you're getting an extra gun um, above what the QEs give you. And in theory, even if you have to expand the barbette a little bit, three triples will take up less space total than four twins. And bearing in mind that the R-Class are supposed to be the kind of the cheaper battle line variants, that means that you can, well, you could either compress the uh, the Citadel length a little bit, which will make them even cheaper than the twin turreted versions, or you can have the same Citadel length as historical and squeeze a little bit more machinery in if you like. So, yeah, this would be entirely possible. I mean, the Austro-Hungarians, the Italians, the Russians, and the Americans at this point have all got triple turrets on their capital ships or are about, or are about to introduce them. So there's no reason why it couldn't be done. Although, as I mentioned in uh, one of the previous answers when people ask about what's my favourite ship designed in uh, Ultimate Animal Dreadnoughts, the other option using exactly the same hull would be this. So this is the start point of my triple turret all forward timeline and this is you know say exactly the same hull exactly the same superstructure exactly the same guns but rearranged more ne well nelson style in our timeline it would then become revenge style in everybody else's timeline but uh, yeah that's an even shorter citadel than the two triples forward one triple aft at which point you can either get them really nice and compact and cheap, or, as you were suggesting, they can extend the machinery to get the speed up to that of the QEs. Although, to be perfectly fair, whilst it's easy with hindsight to see that the QEs being a bit faster made them considerably more useful in World War II, at the time, the Royal Navy was a little bit unsure as to the utility of the QEs because they weren't quite fast enough to keep up with the latest battle cruisers, but their speed also made everybody feel a little bit silly just toodling along with the main battle fleet. So this is why when they were looking at theoretical designs that, for the lack of a better term, you might as well call Leopard or Design Y, um, i.e. the successor to Tiger that was never built. And then, of course, you look at Hood. They are now looking at full battle cruiser speeds with battleship protection, which is the next step up. But, uh, you know, if they'd wanted to, a 23 knot or 24 knot version set up like this would also be feasible, and obviously I would much prefer it. Andrew Dederer asks, I remember someone saying that one of the reasons so many of the German battlecruisers at Jutland made it home, even if barely, was that they had massively larger pumping capacity than their British adversaries, like almost an order of magnitude more. Is this accurate? And what would cause such a difference in secondary equipment? I think I would describe that as incidentally accurate, as in, yes, the Germans did have more pumping capacity in their battle cruisers than the British battle cruisers did, but it's certainly not an order of magnitude more, unless people, well, it's, it's just flat out not, and it's not as large a difference as pe some people would maintain if you're being honest about it, because it's very easy to just go, oh, well, there's this pump with this much capacity, this pump with this much capacity, so on and so on and so on, add it all up and go, oh, well, therefore they have X pumping capacity. Well, that's not actually entirely true. Most ships will have several dedicated pumps that can pump out either a large section of the ship or it might be connected to a system that can pump out almost any portion of the ship, and this is what the Germans had. However, um, there are a couple of things to bear in mind. Firstly, not all the pumps are capable of doing that. So there will be some discrete pumps that will only function for specific areas. And obviously there will also be portable pumps that are located in certain positions but can be moved around but perhaps can only be moved around again into certain areas uh, with any significant ease. So in terms of, you know, we have a hole in our side, there is water coming in, the overall pumping capacity that can be brought to bear at that point will be significantly less than if you just add up the total amount of pumping capacity of all pumps on the ship all over the place. 
And once you take that into account, I, what is the on-the-spot pumping capacity? Whilst most German ships in World War One do have a greater pumping capacity than British ships, this is true, it's not that much greater. Certainly, well, it's not as so it's not so much greater as you know the person that you're talking about would seem to have implied. Um, secondly, the reason why it's only incidentally correct is, of course, none of the British battle cruisers uh, went down. Sorry, none of the British battle cruisers that sank sank because they flooded. Invincible, Indefatigable, and Queen Mary all sank because they exploded and no amount of pumping capacity is going to help. There's no British ship that foundered on the way home because its pumping capacity was inadequate. The fact that the German ships did make it home, well, most of them except for Lutzow, um, the battle cruisers, I would not I would hesitate to say it's because of the pumping capacity. Lutzow's greater pumping capacity didn't help it. And as I pointed out before, one of the big differences between Seydlitz and Lutzow was simply the forward torpedo flat. With Lutzow, once that was flooded, it, no matter what pumping capacity she had, you know, within reason, it really wasn't going to help her. Whereas with Seydlitz, it's almost the other way around. As long as that torpedo flat remained inviolate, she was going to take a very, very long time to go down. And it, technically speaking, she did a couple of times, um, but in a way that it was easy to sort of haul her up a few feet and then keep her going and this is one of the things you've got to bear in mind which is that you know Seydlitz was still suffering from progressive flooding um so the, the pumps weren't keeping up with it and when you look into further detail on you know, Moltke, von der Tann, der Flinger, Seydlitz etc one of the other things you see constant references to is various pumping systems failing and they're either having to switch to other pumps, which is good. You know, if you've got multiple pumps that can link into a single system, then if one goes down, you can still pump something out. But it's obviously better if both are available. And there's also references like people patching in and cross and uh, cross connecting various other pumps to make up for these failures. So it's not like the German battle cruiser that's full of holes can just go oh yes i have arbitrarily large pumping capacity so i'll be fine because the chances are if uh, battle experience is anything to go by after a few hours you're going to have significantly less pumping capacity available than on paper you started out with whereas although the british systems as i said had less capacity overall at least from the british ships that had significant flooding coming in like Marlborough um, maybe war spite they didn't seem to have at quite as many issues with keeping the pumps that they did have actually running so it's a little bit of a 50 50 on that one so I would say the the only one where it probably made any amount of difference was Seidlitz and in that case I'd say yes having a start with somewhat greater pumping capacity probably is one of the factors that helped say let's get home none of the other german battle cruisers so von der tan Moltke, and der flinger were badly damaged enough that you know any navy's pumping system wouldn't have kept them afloat and you know with Seidlitz, there were a lot of other factors that were involved like i said with the torpedo flat and so forth in why she got home as well so Although the German battle cruisers having a somewhat greater pumping capacity than their British counterparts is a useful feature, it's nowhere near as decisive as you know some people might want to think. You, you see similar arguments with Bismarck, which is even more ridiculous because Bismarck's pumping solutions are even more distributed and isolated than some of the German battle cruiser systems. Sui420 Den asks, how did the first torpedo protections evolve? Well, the first anti-torpedo protection systems were torpedo nets. As you can see here, HBIS Hotspur deploying some. And, well, you, you pretty much all know how torpedo nets work. You deploy a big steel net on a bunch of booms out of the ship, and the idea is the torpedo hits the net, gets caught in the net, and hopefully doesn't go off. But, or if it does go off, it then detonates and destroys the net, and the explosion is far enough away from the hull that any damage is minimised. And bearing in mind, ships were already double or triple hulled 
or double or triple bottomed at least, um, partly just because it made good sense, partly because mines had been a thing since at least the 1850s, and so breaching the outer skin of the hull from a somewhat distant torpedo explosion wasn't exactly the end of the world. However, it became very rapidly clear that it was not possible to really sail and fight and have these torpedo nets deployed at the same time, whilst they retained a marginal degree of utility for when ships were at anchor for a while in battle conditions, which is when people were most likely to be launching torpedoes at you, the torpedo nets were pretty useless. And even you know, shortly thereafter, you had the issue of torpedoes getting strong enough to punch through the nets and the torpedo nets themselves causing more issues than they solved when they were folded up against the ship in battle and then got hit by shells. So after this, you had the anti-torpedo bulge as exemplified most hilariously on most of the British monitors but essentially this was kind of like the torpedo net in principle but it involved putting a big blister of steel on each side of the ship again with the idea torpedo explodes far further away out from the hull obviously a sheet of steel backed up by beams is a bit stronger than uh, netting and then you have compartmentalized sections within the bulge, which are, obviously the bulge starts off as full of air. And the idea is the explosion then blows a big hole in the bulge, needs a reasonable amount of energy to punch through the metal that the bulge is made of. And then that section of the bulge floods, and again, minimal to no damage, hopefully, to the internal hull, which is the actual hull of the ship. And so, as you will hopefully see in very short time as of the time of listening to this if you're listening to it on launch um, that's something that say for example is fitted to USS Texas and the advantage of these is that you could fit them to ships that currently didn't have any torpedo protection and because they increased the buoyancy of the ship so reduced the draft well, while they did obviously expand the ship as well if you fared it properly the balance between the incre increased overall displacement because of course the metal weighs a bit versus the increased buoyancy versus the changed hull profile and the changed wetted area. If you did the bulges correctly, you could actually make the ship a little bit faster um, or at the very least not affect the speed too much. Although depending on the size scale and how you did it, you might make the speed of the ship drop slightly as well. But they're an imperfect solution. And so subsequent to that, people started designing torpedo defense systems into the ships. And that's where you get the torpedo defense system or torpedo belt or whatever people want to call it, which is basically the same principle as the bulges, uh, except in multiple layers. So liquid, void, liquid or liquid or void, liquid, void, depending on who's making it, um, unless you go something really special like the Pugliese system for the Italians. And, and then unlike the bulge, it's built into the hull itself. So it doesn't affect the ship's hydrodynamics quite so much. So yeah, that's the basic evolution of torpedo defense. Bill Luster asks, what were the regulations on naval officers and crew when it came to bringing personal weapons aboard ship? It varies considerably by Navy, by time period, and by who you are as well. And I know that sounds wonderfully nonspecific, but it is true. So in the age of sail, if you happen to bring, I don't know, a favored axe, sword, knife, pistol, etc., aboard, Nobody really cared because, hey, when there was a boarding action, having something extra to throw at the enemy or stab them with or shoot them with was all good. As time went on, weapons beca uh, regulations became a little bit more restricted. But then at the same time, if you go aboard something like, say, HMS Warrior, you'll see the thing was crawling with pistols and rifles and swords and <laughs> cutlasses and so forth. So, you know, it didn't really make much odds. And... Even in World War II, ships were still carrying vast numbers of small arms, far more than the Marine Detachment could ever use. So there wasn't really much need to carry personal weapons. You certainly wouldn't be able to just randomly carry personal weapons on duty um, if they were your own personally owned weapons, if you're the regular part of the crew. Um, no one's really going to bat an eye if you happen to have a, a knife or something, a, a you know, in your kit, 
because that's just, you know, people might well have that, that's fine. Um, if you have some kind of firearm out and about on the ship that's not part of the ship's regulated setups and it's not booked in, check they don't know about it, then you could get in a bit more trouble. Um, but if you're that's if you're a regular crew. If you're the officers, however, and you have your own personal quarters and you happen to want to bring a pistol or a rifle of your own aboard... Most of the time, you can usually get away with it. You probably let the captain know, and it'll be fine. Um, the captain themselves might have some. And also, of course, you would have situations where an officer, especially with captain's authorization or the captain themselves, can requisition firearms in addition to the ship's standard complement if they happen to want it. So and this is where you get stories of you know people lining up and doing shotgun practice or rifle practice or pistol practice sometimes it's with the ship's weapons and they've been issued and then they'll be booked back in and sometimes it's with their own personal weapons so if we're talking about the 20th century and specifically when we talk about personal weapons and firearms if your regular crew don't you'll you'll get in a lot of trouble Whereas if you're the officers, depending on your captain and depending on if you ask permission or not, you might well be permitted to. And a lot of it, regardless of what the actual regulations said in terms of enforcement, was more about safety. Because if you are, say, the ship's executive officer or first lieutenant or first officer, depending on what navy you're in, what you want to call them, you've got your own private cabin. If you want to bring a pistol or a hunting rifle aboard ship and the captain says, fine keep it locked up in your cabin, everything's safe. Whereas if you're just random generic crewman sleeping in a room with either hammocks or bunks with 50 to 100 other guys, you can't carry that weapon on duty, uh, unless, of course, you're doing security. And where are you going to put it? And who else could get access to it? That's more the problem. Nathapon Hong Sharon asks... The NavWeb's page for Richelieu's guns has a footnote that says the rate of fire was hampered by the slow rate in which the hoist could deliver projectiles. It took 15 minutes to bring a charge up from the magazines to the guns. What was the problem, and is there any diagram for it? Also, Richelieu wasn't the first fast capital ship with a four-gun turret built for France. Did Dunkirk also have the same issue? Well, as Matt Easton of Skullgirl Editorial would say, CONTEXT! Okay, he probably wouldn't sing it horribly, but context um so the section on nav webs does indeed say um well it's to quote the bit that it quotes says it took 15 minutes to bring up a charge from the magazines to the guns so the ship was realistically capable of firing only two initial four gun salvos before her big guns fell silent now that's a citation from french battleships 1922 to 56 by john jordan so this is where the context is important because if you flip over to said book, you'll find that quote is in the section on when Richelieu is at Dakar. This is right after she has fled Brest whilst still incomplete. And then I will quote most of the paragraph that that statement is in. So uh, this in the co the wider context is that uh, Richelieu has just headed back to Dakar um, after a brief uh, sortie. And it says, and of course the British are closing in. So then it says, frantic efforts now began to get the ship fully operational with a particular focus on the main and secondary guns. The 380mm guns could fire and the main directors were functional. However, the replenishment system needed considerable work. It took fully 15 minutes to bring up a charge from the magazine to the guns, so the ship was realistically capable of firing only two initial four-gun salvos before her big guns fell silent. The other issue was a small number of SD-21 charges that had been embarked at Brest, sufficient for only 49 rounds. So this isn't a fundamental issue with Richelieu's guns. In fact, even the footnote on the NavWeb's page immediately before that quote points out that in gunnery trials in spring 1940, Richelieu managed to achieve, it says, no more than 1.33 rounds per minute, but that's still a lot more than a salvo every 15 minutes. And then in this incident in Dakar is in July 1940, which is the summer. So essentially what you have is a situation where the ship is not complete, various things aren't working, um, 
presumably from the fact that gunnery trials in the spring did allow them to have at least a somewhat reasonable rate of fire, um, albeit somewhat slower than average. That meant at that point, the hoist systems were working to a degree. I suspect what happened is they went out for the gunnery trials. They discovered that they could fire around every one minute, 20 seconds, which is considerably slower than the average of, well, if you're at gunnery trials, potentially up to one round every 30 seconds for most battleships. And I suspect someone went, okay, right, we need to fix some systems. So let's take this apart, work out what's wrong, and then we'll put it back together once we've made it work a bit better. Except that whilst all of that was going on, then Richelieu had to book it for Dakar, which is why the wider passage in French battleships specifically says it needed work. You know, it, they knew it wasn't complete, it wasn't fully functioning. I rather suspect, as a result of that, that they were probably, when it comes to that 15-minute thing, they were probably actually having to use manual chainfalls to hoist the charges up. And obviously, you have to haul up multiple charges per gun, and there are four guns in the turret to hoist charges up for, which is probably where all of the, the, this sort of quarter-hour time limit comes from. But eventually, Richelieu was taken in hand. Um, it's, well... We don't know exactly when the problems were fixed. Were they fixed while she was still in Vichy French service? Or were they fixed when she was taken in hand in Brooklyn Navy Yard? But at some point along the lines, her hoist system was made to work again. Because then once she was seeing service serving alongside the British Pacific Fleet, she was able to fire as quickly as anybody else. So it's not a fundamental problem with the French uh, charge hoist system. It's just the fact that charge hoist system flat out wasn't working at the time. Sebastian asks, was there anything the French Navy in World War II was particularly good at? Thinking in terms of a naval war game, what would the French national trait or unique characteristic be? I honestly can't think of one other than they had some very fast ships. If I was going to put my finger on anything, and this is not meant in any way, shape or form as a kind of Brits ribbing the French kind of thing, I would actually say stubbornness. Um, stubbornness and allegiance to their cause, whatever they happen to have decided their cause to be, because obviously we're talking about um, France, Vichy France, and Free France, which are kind of three different political entities. But when you look at the conduct of French officers and the men, stubbornness is something that comes out repeatedly. Sometimes this is very good, and sometimes it's not quite so good. Uh, it just depends how it expresses itself. So obviously, you know my thoughts on Admiral John Sewell and the, his complete stubborn adherence to what he thought he should do. Um, when I get around to doing Admiral Cunningham Part 3, you'll see how Cunningham had to deal with the French Admiral and Alexandria. And once again, his stubbornness and allegiance to what he believed to be his cause and his country um, was you know, absolutely, it almost 100% completely uh, loyal, which, again, you know, at t various turns during those negotiations, that could be very good or very bad, to the point that you had, you know, it, especially from hindsight, you can sit there and go, well, this French officer, he absolutely clearly wanted to fight. Uh, we're talking about the, the admiral who's in charge at Alexandria. He wanted to continue fighting, but his orders from what he believed to be the legitimate government, the Vichy government, was telling him to do something else. And so he therefore decided, well, those are my orders, therefore I'm going to have to do that. And whilst he was able to give a, a small amount of leeway, uh, it wasn't with anywhere near the same level of flexibility as you might get from some other navies. Now, obviously, in those cases, in the case of Jean Soule, that could be quite detrimental. On the other hand, if you look at someone like the people who decided to join up with a free French navy and then how they fought subsequently, then it could be very, very good because they were absolutely determined and loyal to free France and they would fight to the bitter end to ensure that that came about. And similarly, it meant that when you had situations like um, Operation Torch, the French fought incredibly stubbornly and bitterly as long as they were told 
you have to fight, but also it meant when they were told, right, you no longer have to fight, they were also fairly good about compliance with that. There, there weren't too many incidents of isolated pockets of French soldiers just going, well, you know, stuff it we're fighting on anyway. So it, it is very much a two-edged sword. And then, of course, you have uh, cases like Toulon, where the fact the French would, as it turns out, at least by the time the Germans came into Toulon, they were determined enough the Germans were never going to get their hands on their ships. And so they scuttled the fleet at Toulon. Um and ironically enough, again, if you've watched the Merzel Kabir video, the fact that Admiral Darlan kind of abandoned that and flip flopped all over the place in the weeks leading up to Operation Catapult, in no small part contributed to the problems with Operation Catapult because suddenly the French had gone from predictable, if occasionally those predictions weren't necessarily good for their current or former allies, to at least while Darlan was in charge, who knows what the heck they're doing next. Christian B asks, has there ever been an occasion where a shipyard went hurry up just to make their ship the lead ship and thus namesake for the class? I would say it's entirely possible and I would say very believable that some shipyards have actually tried this, um, but I personally am not aware directly of any specific instance I could point you to. Um, that being partly because, well, that's the kind of menu show that unfortunately I haven't actually looked into, and partly because... A lot of the time, classes were determined by the class name of the, or well, the name of the ship that was ordered first. Um, and that's why you sometimes get these weird things where you, you look at, okay, well, this is the first, the ship that was launched first, and this is maybe even the ship that was commissioned first, and those might be two different ships. But neither of those ships' names are the class name, because then when you look at, well, when was the keel laid down, and the first ship that had its keel laid down might be the the name ship of the class. So since the the classes tend or the, the name of the class tended to be decided before mo any of those ships had hit the water, a, a lot of the time it wouldn't necessarily serve a shipyard particularly well to rush a job for those purposes. Although given that some navies at some times would name a class for the first ship that was launched or for the first ship that went into the into service or the media might dub it so i can conceivably see where some shipyards would try that and then of course that leaves you with the wonderful instances of um, several different classes across several different nations where people use different names for the class and that's not just for something like the astoria class becoming the new orleans class it can be for classes where both ships were around for quite a while or for their entire service lives and people still, you know, say, oh, well, I call it this class and someone says, I call it that class. I mean, there's a reason why after the Queen Elizabeth, you sometimes hear people refer to the R class because whether it's the revenge class or the royal sovereign class or some other class, <laughs> you'll find almost, almost all the R class giving their name to the name of the overall class of vessels at some point in somebody's book. Graham William Kidd asks, I'm viewing some old dry docks, and I'm currently up in the low 50s. Both then and now, you deride naval history entries on Wikipedia. Why is this? I read these entries and I get a lot from them. Have they improved in the last couple of years, or am I missing something? Now, to be clear, there are some fairly good naval history entries on Wikipedia. And you know, the information that they have is fairly valid. However, there are a few issues with it. Um, first of all, is to me personally, the quality of a Wikipedia entry quite often depends on the number of sources and how frequently they're cited on the page. So if you come across a naval history entry that has, you know, let's say for it's for a big battle and there might be 50 or 60 little footnotes there. And then when you scroll down to the bibliography and the further reading, there's sort of two columns of entries and there's about 20 or 30 different sources cited. That's probably, and I stress probably, an indicator of a fairly good quality article because they can back things up with various other sources. Um, whereas if you read an entry where there's maybe one source cited two or three times and massive blocks of text with nothing cited uh, as a source for it, 
then you have to start going, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not necessarily so sure about this. And that, you know, trying to determine which is which, unless you're specifically looking for these kind of footnote entries, can be quite difficult. Um, you can also have entries which have extensive footnoting, but maybe only from one or two sources. And again, that can be good or bad. For example, um, if you have, uh, let's really reach for some low-hanging fruit. If you have an article on a German ship from World War II, and it's singing its praises left, right, and center, but only ever cites a single book, then that's probably written by a fanboy and a bit dodgy. Conversely, most of the entries on Imperial Russian battleships, you know, late ironclads and uh, pre-dreadnoughts, you'll find that a lot of the time, outside of a few Russian language sources, the vast majority of the footnotes lead to Steve McLaughlin's Russian and Soviet battleships. So, you know, there's not a huge variety of sources cited, but then there aren't a huge variety of sources for Russian and Soviet battleships, period. And Steve McLaughlin's book is absolutely brilliant. So in that case, it's actually fine that um, there's a, there's only a limited number of sources cited because, again, but this is the thing, it requires you to know that that source is good, which it is, um, even if some of the entries are quite literally someone's copy-pasted whole paragraphs out of the book and then you have the other problem which is that wikipedia entries can be edited by anyone and then you go into the talk pages of some of the more controversial sections and people argue back and forth pretty much like they do on any internet forum and then you get strongly opinionated people who will remove things or add things based on their personal biases essentially they're like oh well yes you might have support from for this statement from this source this source and this source but i don't like it and so i'm going to just remove it or i want to promote this view and therefore i'm going to add it even if there isn't really a source for it or the source is dubious um and then you get into edit wars and things like that and then you have selective quotations, selective editing. So yes, they might be linking to a very reputable source and they might be linking to even a page that talks about what they're talking about. But sometimes you get very creative uh, Wikipedia editors who can present basically a completely false picture of what is actually being said. Um, so if you want to go properly biblical, it's something, you know, I like to invent things like, you know, the, um, the Issei paradox for hybrid carriers and so forth. And I, I call this the, the Psalms paradox, um, or the Psalms hypocrisy. So referring back to the Old Testament in the Bible, because if you very selectively quote out of the one specific verse, you can legitimately say that the Bible says there is no God. The fact that immediately before that on the line above, it says the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, <laughs> you know, the context completely changes the thing that is being quoted. And similarly, you sometimes get people who are like, well, you know, this really reputable source, Norman Friedman or Steve McLaughlin or Vince O'Hara or, you know, Andrew Lambert, etc. you know, that's the, that's their citation. So you think, okay, authoritative citation statement. Hmm, okay, that statement seems a little bit strong and not something I've heard of before. But oh, and then you might think, oh, okay, well, if that's what someone with that level of seniority says, we guess we'll have to accept it. Unless and until you go into that relevant book and you're like, hang on a minute, <laughs> this is completely the opposite. You very very cherry picked that quote, Mister Mysterious Wikipedia editor. Now, I know I sound like I'm going on about a lot of negatives, but my point is that if someone's written a good, solid article, it's a good, solid article. There isn't much more to say about it. I've covered kind of some of the some of the potential indicators of a good, solid article. But there are so many things which people can do if they have an agenda or if they're just ignorant or they just have a bias or whatever, which can make articles really bad. And when you're reading Wikipedia unless you already have prior knowledge and the ability to actually cross-reference and check things, you have to be very, very careful because it's it's unreliable in terms of overall quality. 
and that's why I I've and I've said this before with Wikipedia. Wikipedia, if you want to learn about naval history, is a great place to find books, websites, and PDFs to read about the thing you're interested in learning. And then you can make a judgment as to what on the article was accurate or not. And once again, I have to emphasize, you know, to those people who are out there who are writing naval Wikipedia articles that are up to spec and high quality, well done. Please keep doing so. You know, you are doing a service to people because it means it's increasing the reliability of the site. But at the same time, um, just to be on the safe side, apart from anything else, if you see something on Wikipedia, you always go back to the sources and double check it. And if it doesn't have any sources to go back to and double check, um, start waving red flags. DM Phoenix asks, in modern times, the Japanese maritime self-defense forces have named various vessels after World War II era Imperial Navy warships, such as Soryu, Kaga, Hyuga, Ise, and Kongo, and Megami as well for that matter. However, this has not been replicated in the modern day German Navy, except for some submarine U numbers, which have been reused, um, which I think is because of the strong societal association of names such as Bismarck and Tirpitz to Nazism and fascism. Do you feel that there are German, Japanese or Italian warship names that you would consider taboo for current usage? And similarly, are there Axis warship names which you would consider to be acceptable for modern sensibilities? I think you have to look at various um, tick boxes. I hate to use the tick box exercise, but really when it comes to the warships that the Axis powers used, I would say you're looking at meaning, appropriateness, and symbolism. And if your name doesn't tick one of those boxes as a red flag, then I would say go ahead and use it. So, you know, something like Kaga. Kaga doesn't have any particularly offensive underlying meaning. It's just named after the Kaga province in Japan. It's no different from the Royal Navy calling something HMS Norfolk or the US Navy calling something USS Massachusetts. So that's fine. Um, appropriateness. Well, again, it's a province, so who cares? Um, <laughs> as opposed to, say, skipping over to the Allies with some of the, with the tribal class, for example, that the Royal Navy used. Now, I've pointed out in the past, some people won't say blanket, oh no, you shouldn't you reuse any of the tribal class names, except for the fact that actually some of the tribes, dash nations that had destroyers named after them with uh, the tribal club, well, both World War I and World War II and post-war tribal classes, some of them actually really liked the idea um, the Ashanti people, for example, were actually quite thrilled with HMS Ashanti. Um, now, HMS Eskimo, yeah, you you could have some issues of that because some people today take issue with the word es or the name Eskimo. But in in those kinds of cases, i.e., is the would the name cause offence? And when I say offence, proper offence to a group of people, um, if you used it today, or you know, how, however that distinction is made, then you should, I think, just ask them, <laughs> you know, do you mind if we reuse it? And if they say yes, then don't use it. And if they say no, we don't care, or yeah, that sounds like fun, then go ahead. Um, and frankly, anybody else who tries to get offended on behalf of the people who've said it's fine to go ahead can go jump in a lake, preferably with concrete shoes on. Um, and then you finally got the symbolism aspect. So what does the name symbolize outside of its actual meaning? So for example, Littorio, you would fall foul on the first stage, um, the actual meaning of the name, because it refers to symbol of the Italian fascist movement or what they would adopt for it. So, you know, the direct meaning is pretty much unacceptable for the for a modern Italian naval vessel and its symbolism as a symbol of Italian fascism as far as the name is concerned would make it impossible to use so that's two elements but then you have something like Bismarck in theory there's nothing particularly wrong with the name Otto von Bismarck um, or Bismarck for short 
I mean, people might take issue with the fact he was an expansionist colonialist German chancellor, but, you know, if you want to not find an expansionist colonialist-imperialist 19th century European politician, you're going to be scraping the barrel, I think. Um, that's pretty much all of them, uh, which, you know, depending on your political viewpoint, you might decide I'm just don't name things after 19th century politicians, which, okay, is fair enough. But, you know, in and of itself, at least from my point of view, the name Bismarck is not controversial enough to immediately um, put it out of the running. But because of the battleship Bismarck in World War II and it being a massive symbol for the Nazis and, um, you know, Hitler playing it up, the symbolism of it, regardless of the meaning, is probably just a bit too strong for it to be reused any time soon for a, a long, long time. But if you can get past that, you know, meaning, appropriateness and symbolism barriers, then feel free to go ahead and reuse the names as, as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, if you look at the Littorio class, Roma, Impero, uh, Vittorio Veneto, you can reuse all of those names just fine. Um, I'd be perfectly happy to see a German ship called Admiral Scheer or Admiral Hipper. You know, I've got no, no real issues there. Prince Eugen would be funny, again, to have, have that ship pop up. Um, Deutschland, Lutzau, Graf Spee, you know, none of those are tripping my uh, my dials and going, no, 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 you absolutely shouldn't have those. Um, Tirpitz, Tirpitz might have some symbology issues, but otherwise... But, you know, they're very slightly, maybe. And Scharnhorst, Gneisenau, now Blucher, again, not really got much of a problem with those. Again, but this is me personally. Opinions may vary on exactly where those lines are drawn. Kevin Weber asks, On several occasions you've talked about the use of poor quality coal, but I don't recall any mention of fires in the flues or stacks due to creosote buildup. I do know fires have occurred in industrial and residential use due to poor coal. Have there been any notable incidents in navies, or does design and or rigorous maintenance preclude them? There are scattered mentions throughout naval history in the early 20th century and the late 19th century of fires in funnels and fires further up so between the funnels and the boilers. So it's possible that those were caused by creosote buildup, but the accounts that I've read of those fires haven't ever really specified exactly what caused them um, in terms of, yeah, oh yeah, it was a buildup of this specific thing that made everything catch fire. So I couldn't swear to it being 100% a creosote buildup um, or any other kind of buildup. But as like I said, funnel fires were known to be an occasional hazard. But as you mentioned in the latter part of the question, I mean, it's not so much a design thing. There's there's only a limited amount you could do to stop the buildup of sort of various products of byproducts of coal burning. But the boilers and funnels of ships were quite rigorously maintained. Uh, and there's two elements to that. One is that obviously a ship with coal generally is only going to be out at sea with its engines running for if it's a destroyer, a few days, if it's a cruiser or a battleship, maybe a few weeks, possibly extending to some months if they can refuel, um, especially in the case of a cruiser. But at some point, they are going to come into port, shut down their engines and essentially go cold, at which point maintenance and cleaning can and will be done. Whereas fires in industrial and residential buildings i suspect are probably happening after months if not years of residue build up eventually all coming to a head and the other issue is that because obviously especially with um the low quality coal that a lot of the high seas fleet was using in world war one if you go all out so you're you know trying to get up to maximum speed and burning them through an awful lot of poor quality coal you're going to get ash and clinker build up which is going to smother your boilers inside of a day, which is what happened to a good chunk of the high seas fleet at the, during the night part of Jutland. And when that happens, you have to clear everything out, and there's only a limited amount you can do at that stage until you get into port and then everything again goes cold, and then you really have to give everything a good scrub out. So 
the kind of incidents in naval vessels which are most likely to cause a significant buildup of waste materials inside the boiler and funnel system are also the kind of things that are probably going to cripple the ship to the point where they're going to be cleaned out again in pretty short order. How many Blackburn Blackburns could a Blackburn Blackburn burn if a Blackburn Blackburn could burn Blackburn Blackburns? Asks, are there any books or other resources that have pictures or drawings of naval uniforms from 1800 to 1950 from the various navies around the world? I'm not aware of a single book or resource, personally. If someone is, please let us know. Uh, but there are a number of Osprey books which cover specific naval services in specific time periods. Um, so, for example, there's a couple of different Osprey books that cover Japanese naval uniforms, sort of 1907 to, 1930, to 1945, similar ones for Royal Navy, etc., etc. But as a sort of an overall, well, here's what everybody dressed as from 1800 to 1950. I'm not aware of that. About the closest you're going to come, as long as you don't mind there being not basically no pictures. Um, of people in full uniform, is there's a US Navy issue document that is now, I believe, free to download, because it's public domain now, from 1941, called Uniforms and Insignia Foreign Navies, published by the United States Navy Department. And that goes through Britain, Germany, France, Italy, Holland, uh, or the Netherlands, and Japan, as well as Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Spain, Russia, Turkey, Portugal, Chile, Brazil, China, Peru, and Argentina. And it then verbally describes the differences in the various uniforms, as well as showing how the rank bars and so forth are on in every single na of Navy in question. And so if you want to have a sort of kind of a snapshot of early world war ii uniforms that's probably the best place to go but um beyond that there's there's a few books about specific navies um so there's one by henry powers naval uniforms through the ages 10 centuries of the royal navy um but otherwise you're going to be looking at either very time specific or service specific books Nick Brodar asks, how does the number of blades and their pitch affect a propeller's performance? So the pitch, i.e. the angle at which the blades are tilted, the steeper the pitch, i.e. The, the, the more they bite into the water, if you like, then that's obviously more water that a propeller blade will displace every time it sweeps through the water, but also because it's got to move more water, the more resistance it's going to meet, whereas a shallower pitch propeller blade will move less water per revolution, um, but as a result meets far less resistance per revolution. So the pitch of your propeller will affect its efficiency at particular speed regimens. So for every pitch angle, there'll be a speed regimen for which it is the most effective, which is why some ships these days, and even some ships back in the day, had or have now variable pitch propellers so that they can change the efficiency at the, the different speed margins, which is also why variable pitch propellers are very useful on aircraft, um, and those were definitely being introduced in World War II. So depending on where you want your ship to have the better performance, um, if you are designing your ship with a reasonable top speed, but you think that you'd actually want the best fuel efficiency when it's just at cruising speed, then you design your propeller's pitch to give you the most efficiency at that cruising speed and accept the fact you're going to have a slightly higher than average coal cons or oil consumption when you're running at top speed. Or you could optimize the ship for absolute top speed and accept the fact that you're going to have a slightly subpar efficiency at cruising speed. Now, with the number of blades, this is um, a rather complex trade-off because fewer blades means more efficiency and also less resistance. But part of that lack of resistance is because there's less surface area because obviously as the ship's moving forward, it's moving through the water, the water it will be hitting the back of the blades and then causing everything to slow down again. So 
if you increase the number of blades, you increase the overall surface area for a given diameter, which means you've got a little bit more, if you like, grip on the water. So you can chuck more water downrange, but you also face more resistance. Um, also, the more blades you have, the smoother the ride you have. Because if you have a two-blade propeller, bearing in mind as the propeller moves through the water, you're going to have areas of high and low pressure. So as the blade in moves past the hull, it's throwing water out of its path. So that's going to create an area of high pressure. And then between the blades will be an area of low pressure. So if you've got a two-blade propeller, you can get a thump, 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 thump on the hull. A three-blade propeller, where the gaps are less, you might get some sort of thump, 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 thump. And the more blades you add, the more that just kind of evens out into a gradual hum. So that might seem nicer, but I'll just say you've got the additional resistance to make up, to contend with. Plus also, as a propeller blade moves through the water, it creates all sorts of vortexes and disturbances in its wake. And the more blades you have, the closer the next blade is to the uh, preceding blade's turbulence, which is why the uh, fewer blades, like a two-blade propeller, is more efficient because those blades are moving through, relatively speaking, undisturbed water. Whereas if you have a four or five or six-blade propeller, you are basically moving through the disturbance created by the previous blade, which lowers each individual blade's efficiency. Now, there are various ways to try and get around that, but they're very complex and that's kind of the world of modern propeller design, which is a completely separate issue. That's one of the reasons why a lot of modern propeller designs are so secret. And this trade-off of different factors is why outside of very specific and special circumstances, you will normally see most warships of the early 20th century with three-bladed propellers, because that it was generally held to give the best of both worlds. The Almighty Hypnotoad asks, why did the collision between RMS Empress of Ireland and MV Storstad occur, and who is ultimately to blame for it? The Wreck Commissioner's Inquiry placed the full blame on the Storstad, however modern reanalyzing, re possibly, says both parties are to blame. What are your thoughts? So for those of you who are unaware, this was a collision that occurred in the early part of the 20th century, uh, specifically in early 1914, just before the First World War broke out, between the liner, Empress of Ireland, which was heading out of the St. Lawrence River, which was hit broadside on by the Storstad, uh, which chucked, you know, tore a massive great hole inside of the ship. And then once the two ships drifted apart, you know, big hole, longitudinal bulkheads, portholes open, and everyone... Well, most people are asleep, no time to close up any watertight bulkheads that were left, and the thing rolled over and sank and took a lot of people down with it. And then when the Court of Inquiry was heard, most of the people on the store stat had one story, most of the survivors from Empress of Ireland had another story, and the two different stories are completely irreconcilable. All that is known is that the collision, for certain, happened in fog. Now, I can only go off of what various books and newspaper reports have written about it because I genuinely do not have the time to hunt down and read the full interview transcripts even if they're still available but from what I can tell it seems that well as we know both ships entered fog they thought they were do making various maneuvers which in fact the other side wasn't and they ended up meeting up in a collision with the irony, of course, being that if they'd just done exactly what they were doing when they went into the fog bank, they probably would have missed each other. However, whilst there's a degree of blame probably for both sides in that, I mean, let's face it, if you enter a fog bank where you can't see anything and you know there's another ship that may be coming close to you or directly for you, Trying to exchange basic information via foghorn when you have no idea where the other person is is probably a bit of a dumb move. So realistically, if the last sight you've had of the other ship is, well, there's a potential collision going on here, it's a moving fog bank, 
and you know it's going to pass in a few tens of minutes at most it really if for an from an ultimate safety perspective it should have been both ships slowed to a complete crawl or even to a halt and waited for the fog to pass unless or until they managed to establish specific communication with each other and work out what was going on so in that respect both parties have a degree of blame however Again, depending on who you believe, um, and this is obviously then up for debate, but it seems that the Empress of Ireland did slow down to a degree. So even if they weren't stopping, they were sort of feeling their way through the fog. Whereas, well, you just have to look at the bow of the um, Storstad afterwards, considering that this was an ice-reinforced ship to tell that that ship was not moving at a slow pace when it slammed into the Empress of Ireland. Even if they claim they reversed engines at the last minute, they must have been moving at a reasonable clip, at which point, you know, they kind of charged headlong, or as headlong as you can with a fully loaded collier, um, into a fog bank, regardless of what manoeuvres they thought they were making, and they ended up broadsiding another ship. So... Whilst both sides could have done something to avoid it, there was a lot more that Storstad could have done to avoid the problem. Um, and whilst Empress of Ireland, as I said, there maybe there were a few other things they could have done, but not as much. Thomas Dudkiewicz asks, I recently visited London and the National Maritime Museum, and one of the models had me scratch my head. Why on earth did the Royal Navy use and apparently have purpose-built paddle-wheeled minesweepers during World War I? Well, the Royal Navy had quite a few paddle-wheeled ships even into World War II. Uh, at some point, I must tell you the story in more detail. I think I've told it in a previous dry dock as well of HMS Sand down the paddle-wheeled anti-aircraft ship of World War II. Um, but broadly speaking, when it comes to the Royal Navy and having paddle-wheeled vessels in the 20th century, it'll come down to one of three things. One of three things. Either it's a legacy craft um which is relatively rare by the 20th century but still possible secondly it's a paddle wheeled civilian vessel that's been brought into service as the result of uh, wartime contingencies which was the case for a number of the early paddle wheeled mine sweepers and then the third option the purpose built option is because the paddle drive offers some kind of inherent advantage that other forms uh, particularly obviously of screw propulsion do not and in the case of the purpose-built paddle wheel minesweepers, there were three primary reasons why the Royal Navy went with them. And you can see one of them just here. So reason one was that they were faster than trawlers. Trawlers, both brought into service and naval trawlers that were built specifically for the purpose, had been, and for significant portions of World War One and even in World War II, would remain a good chunk of the minesweeping forces. But trawlers are not designed to be particularly fast. The paddle steamers were faster, and so they could get to the minefields faster. And also in adverse currents, they could work considerably quicker. Whereas obviously, when you had the minesweeper trawlers in the Dardanelles, a strong-ish current coming down there was enough to almost bring them to a screaming halt. So speed is one thing. Another thing is that paddle-wheeled vessels can be much shallower draft because of course the uh, well there's numerous reasons for that one of the reasons the drive shaft of the paddle wheels is above the water line so ideally unless you want to put in lots of cranks and linkages the engines can should be mounted a little bit higher if the engines and the therefore also the boilers don't need to be mounted so low down to align with an underwater screw shaft that means the depth of machinery is not a limiting factor for how shallow you can make the hull. Plus, of course, you don't have a propeller shaft going down the underside of the hull, so that also means you can make the ship's underside a bit shallower. And obviously, I mean, you have to allocate for beam and stuff as well, but essentially a you can make a paddle-driven vessel relatively easily with a significantly shallower draft than a similar size screw-driven vessel, which in turn is quite useful when you're going mine sweeping because then mines set to a certain depth, like say mines designed to touch off on the underside of a capital ship, just won't hit a paddle wheel mine sweeper. 
And then the third reason is agility, because of course, mine sweeping is a fairly slow process. Uh, you don't go charging through a minefield at 20 knots. And in that event, when you're proceeding at three, five, eight knots, something like that, propeller driven ships with, uh, you know, screw, just a screw and rudder or multiple screws and rudder, they can be a little bit iffy in their steering and they still need to, you know, turn in a radius. Whereas a paddle wheeled vessel can maintain pretty accurate steerage by obviously varying the speed and direction of its paddles, even at extremely low speeds. And at worst comes to worst, most paddle wheel vessels can also near enough turn on the spot. So they're considerably more agile generally and at low speed as compared to a screw driven vessel. So those are the main reasons why a paddle driven minesweeper might hold great attraction for the Royal Navy during that time period. John McCarthy asks, the US Navy used two 16 inch guns in their fast battleships of World War II, the 1645 and the 1650. The latter gun is known for better penetration than the shorter barreled version, and you've remarked previously on the truly insane power of the 16 inch 50. What is the secret source that made the performance so much better? There's a few other minor factors, but the two biggest ones is more boom. Um, the 16 inch 45 uses a total of about 500, I think it's 535 pounds of propellant to kick its shell down range. And of course, assuming they're both using the AP Mark 8 2,700 pound super heavy shell, whereas the 16 inch 50 uses 660 pounds of uh, explosive to chuck the, the shell down range. So there's considerably more boom pushing the shell. And you know, that can be most exemplified by the fact that if you go to Massachusetts, Alabama, or North Carolina, the average bag charge, bearing in mind you have to build up six of them, is around 90 pounds. Whereas if you go to any of the Iowas, the average bag charge is 110 pounds and you need six of them on either ship to make up a full charge. So that's one factor. But the other factor is that not only do you have the big boom, but obviously the big boom will only get you so far if your barrel is relatively short, because after that, the remaining boom will be most expended in the open air. And because the 16 inch 50 is an extra five calibers longer, so it's an extra 80 inches longer than the 16 inch 45 that means that your extra big boom is contained for longer and therefore putting more propulsive power into the shell so that combination of longer containment plus more force in the first place means that the mark 8 shell goes flying at a considerably higher speed so for example with a brand new gun where the tolerances are nice and tight the 16 inch 50 can send the Mark 8 shell out at 2,500 feet per second. And if you're doing the same with a 16 inch 45, you're going to get about 2,300 feet per second. So all of the other stuff, as well as these two major factors, is going into the fact that that Mark 8 shell is leaving the barrel of an Iowa class battleship going about 200 feet per second faster than it would be leaving the barrels from a North Carolina or a South Dakota class battleship. And that in turn translates to more penetration downrange. Alternate historian Turtle Duck asks, if copper and tin deposits were in much higher quantity compared to iron deposits, so as to make it cheaper to create bronze, how would this affect the development of naval guns from the age of sail to the modern day? Well, if there's a lot more tin and copper, and more to the point, if there's a lot more tin and copper in approximately similar places, because that's one of the major issues with making bronze, you need an international trade network a lot of the time. There's very, very few countries that are lucky enough to have significant tin deposits and significant uh, copper deposits lying around. So, you know, if this higher ratio of appearance of copper and tin means that you know, various countries can also say, well, we have our own tin deposits and our own copper deposits, so we can make bronze internally without having to rely on anybody else. Well, for a while, that's going to mean bronze guns stick around for a lot longer because early iron guns were hideously unreliable compared to bronze guns. 
And to a certain extent, bronze guns even remained re more reliable, or at least safer, than iron guns, even once iron guns were relatively safely mass manufactured, due to the different ways that bronze and iron fail. But the sheer cost of iron, in the reduced cost of the iron guns, and the fact they could be manufactured in such massive quantities, therefore, made them very attractive. If you've got lots of bronze, then and the, therefore the cost element is less, then that's going to encourage you to keep bronze, which is, for the most part, of in the era of smoothbore cannon, kind of Mary Rose to HMS Victory, still held to be somewhat of the superior metal for gun founding. But ultimately, it's still going to cost somewhat more because while you can cast bronze and it's slightly easier to work with than iron because it's slightly softer metal, the fact is you are still going to need two sets of mines, one for copper and one for tin, and you're also going to need two sets of refining furnaces to turn your tin ore and copper ore into tin and copper, which you can then melt down to cast into a bronze gun, Whereas with iron, you just need an iron ore mine and then you smelt it into iron. So you're expending less effort, less man hours, and you're also expending less energy in terms of how much fuel you're going to be burning to create iron as compared to the more that you're going to need to create bronze. And yes, I know bronze can both, well, copper, tin and bronze all are molten at less, at a lower temperature than iron. So Individually, you need slightly more energy to smelt iron, but whether that energy cost is double that that you need to smelt copper and tin is another matter entirely, because for the sake you've got to combine two. However, bronze is, as I said, softer than iron, so once you get past maybe 30 to 35 caliber guns and you start getting much more powerful weapons, i.e., the latter part of the 19th century, you're going to have to make the transition over to iron and rather quickly to steel because, well, you you could make a 40 to 45 caliber bronze gun firing armor piercing shells using cordite. I'm not sure I'd want to be anywhere in the vicinity when you did, but it could be done. You'd be, but you'd be much better off doing it out of steel. Unemployed history major asks, how has the volume of paperwork aboard a ship at sea changed throughout time? And what are some of the reports that would be written before email? How would these reports be transmitted back and who would they be transmitted to? I can think of watch reports, ships log, supply logs and requisitions, but what else is there? Well, despite the advent of the so-called paperless office, the volume of paperwork aboard ships has only increased the more and more the technology has been available. It you know, because when paper was in very short supply, people magically didn't have to write that many reports. As paper became more and more common and more readily accessible, magically the number of reports that people were demanding increased. And then typewriters came in and then computers came in and so on and so forth. And every time a better way to store information and transmit it has come about, the powers that be higher up have suddenly demanded more and more reports and paperwork to go with it. Uh, I think at some point in the next few decades, if we're still all around at that point, we'll probably enter a realm where the ship's going to need like half its crew just constantly filling in report forms to make sure that everybody is uh, who's back on shore is satisfied that everything is being done exactly to their requirements, even if their requirements are frankly insane. Nonetheless, if you go all the way back to the age of sail, for example, you would the captain would have his log uh, book the ship would have the log usually written by the ship's master um, and then the quartermaster would obviously have his supplies at quartermaster or purser they'd have their supply logs and that governs your requisitions money materials etc etc other people could keep their own log books so surgeons might or physicians or doctors depending on what you've got aboard the ship they might keep their logbook of you know this person came in with this injury today i've sawed off so many limbs the next day and so on and so forth and the various other officers aboard the ship might keep their own logs so the carpenter might 
midshipmen might, um, lieutenants or the lieutenant, depending on the size of the ship, might, but it's not necessarily obligatory, although it's usually good to be able to keep an eye on everything. But broadly speaking, captain's log, the master's or ship's log, and the supply and requisitions logs would be the ones that the age of sail ship had to keep. And then anything beyond that, if the ship ended up in an action or something, you might have a report or several being drafted by the captain and all the ship's officers and sent it back to the Admiralty for information. But before email, in terms of how you transmit the reports, well, back in the age of sail, some of the stuff like the ship's logs would only be examined once the ship came into a friendly port at the end of its commission. Um, specific stuff like battle reports and other stuff that was felt necessary would be be sent back with packets or sloops or cutters and basically small fast messenger ships maybe even frigates if a frigate or even a ship of the line was heading home you might send reports back with them and then as time went on you get telegraph and radio some reports can be transmitted back that way so I mean you're not going to sit there and transmit in the clear for hours upon hours upon hours on end in wartime, or even, to be honest, in peacetime, and just saying about war and peace, but you might send back abbreviated versions of reports, and if you can come in to a port that has your relevant Navy's ambassador or naval attaché in port, you can perhaps deliver a written report to them, and they might be able to deliver either extracts or the entire thing via the telegraph system or similar. And these things evolve over time. So the ability of radio to send significantly more information in World War II as compared to World War I. Richard Su asks, did the Imperial Japanese Navy rotate crews between their still floating ships very often? And specifically, did the Japanese Navy practice reassigning trained crews from combat proven warships to newly commissioned warships? And if not, is this why the carrier Junio was able to limp back to port after getting torpedoed? The Japanese Navy was a little bit less flexible about moving people around than other navies. There were still intership transfers, um, the same as in any other navy, but as you found with the air groups of Shikaku and Zuikaku, the Japanese Navy was a little bit more on the side of trying to keep uh, the bulk of a crew on a ship for as long as possible. Of course, they did still practice um, fairly standard stuff. You know, if a ship went in for refit, it would the crew would then be sent on to, well, in other navies might be distributed through other ships. The Japanese, if they could, would try and reassign the bulk of the crew to another similar vessel. So, for example, if you took a, a Takao-class heavy cruiser, if uh, Takao herself let's say it went into refit, but Atago was about to emerge from refit, then they might transfer um, the bulk of Takao's crew that didn't need uh, extensive shore leave. They might get all ported over to Atago to take her out the other side. Um, but there's a fair bit of variation going on between peacetime and wartime and specific sizes of crew, because obviously an aircraft carrier's crew has some very specific skills, so you might want to put them wholesale over to another aircraft carrier, whereas a Takao-class cruiser's crew might fit perfectly well if there's a couple of Megamis or a Miyoko that needs some more men, and the same thing kind of thing with destroyers and so on and so forth. Um, if a crew was being broken up quite significantly, maybe um, because there wasn't a specific ship that needed a whole, basically a whole fresh crew put into it, or maybe they just ran out of that kind of ship, then you could split an experienced crew across multiple other ships to try and build up their skill and to act as a sort of a training cadre for the less experienced crew who are coming in. So that certainly is a, a thing. But once a ship entered it into commission, Generally speaking, the Japanese would like to try and keep the crew together as much as humanly possible. Um, in terms of Junio, I mean, it depends. Do you mean the torpedoing in 1943 or the torpedoing much later on towards the end of her career? Uh, but in either case, I mean, the thing is with torpedoes, it very, very much depends where they hit. 
yes, in the latter case, which was the much more serious one, Junio's crew at that point should have been fairly experienced in how to manage their ship, and therefore they would have an upper hand over a freshly minted ship with a freshly minted crew. But at the same time, as I said, exactly where the torpedoes hit and what kind of flooding they put they cause is as much of a factor as anything else. Um, you know, f- for example, with to sort of flip it on its head when it comes to torpedoes in that area, Prince of Wales's crew, you know, okay, you could argue that if they'd had more experience, they wouldn't have restarted that propeller shaft. But once that happened, and even an experienced crew, if they were told you need to restart that shaft, probably would have had to do so anyway. But once that's that was done and massive holes were opened up along various bulkheads, it doesn't matter how experienced a crew you are, that ship's doomed. Um, whereas if you get torpedo impacts in relatively unimportant areas or areas that have a lot of compartmentalization, that's considerably better to ca- take two or three impacts there than one impact directly adjacent to a big machinery space. A salty potato asks, what exactly happened to cause the miscommunication that resulted in the Iowa's 16-inch 50s becoming what they became? It all came about due to assumptions between the Bureau of Ordnance and the Bureau of Construction and Repair as to exactly how the Iowa's were going to be armed. Because people knew that the Iowa's were going to be using 16-inch 50 caliber guns. That was one of the things that was asked for in the, if you like, the second stage of the of the detailed design process, because initially the very basic specs of an Iowa were South Dakota, but faster. And then, as Norman Friedman points out, people were just like, well, why are we paying 10,000 tons for five knots? This seems a bit wasteful. We want something else. OK, well, the Navy was like, we can put some slightly bigger guns on it. And the Bureau of Ordnance was sort of sitting there going, mm, OK. We have some 16-inch Mark 50 gun, uh, 16-inch 50 caliber guns lying around. We built a ton of them back in the 1920s for the 1920 South Dakota class, so and for the Lexingtons for that matter. So we can use those. And so the Bureau of Ordnance happily sat down and started working on a turret that could comfortably fit three 16-inch 50 Mark II guns. That's the 1920s guns. And then the Bureau of Construction and Repair on the other hand, who were designing the actual ship and therefore the barbettes that would sit on the ship, they knew that the Iowa's, crudely speaking, being stretched South Dakotas with more machinery, had certain constraints in the widths of the ship, especially around the forward turret 16-1 and the overall width of the ship, because it had to go through the Panama Canal and all sorts of other things. And so they looked at it and went, well, Clearly, um, we are going to need a fairly compact turret to sit on here without making the barbettes overly wide. So we're going to design a barbette for a fairly compact turret because that seems logical because to put any large turret on is going to have severe design impacts on various things like the protection systems and how you get around the barbettes and so forth. And since neither side spoke to the other, they ended up with a barbette that was far too small to fit the Bureau of Ordnance's planned relatively large turret to fit the Mark II gun. And, well, since the barbettes are a fundamental part of the ship's hull and the overall part of the ship's design, it was then down onto the Bureau of Ordnance to go, okay, well, if we've only got a barbette that can fit a relatively compact turret, so we have to design a relatively compact turret, the Mark II guns can't fit in this relatively compact turret, so we have to very quickly design the Mark VII to fit the turret that can fit the barbette that will work with the Iowas. Grumman Cat asks, How did navies address the dangers of embers and hot gases igniting the sails on early steam sail hybrid ships? Were certain sails only allowed to be unfurled when steam wasn't in use? Partly by running under either sail or steam, That's always one option. So obviously if they're running under steam only, all the sails will be furled. If they're running under sail only, then there's no risk from steam. Um, Some captains would try and wet down the sails of the mast that's immediately after the funnels. Um, Admittedly, there are some depictions and photos of ships that are set under sail and steam where the mast immediately after the funnel isn't 
unfurled. It may be running only on the foremast and the mizzen mast. Um, but sometimes you will see pictures or illustrations where the engines are going full and all the sails are out. So say in that case, it may be a case of wetting the sails down, or and it also might just be the case of ensuring that A, the boilers are functioning properly and efficiently, so you don't really get embers, but also you would have um, various traps and I guess you would today we call them filters built into the trunking and the funnels to also minimize that. Because, I mean, generally speaking, some of these ships, depending on what kind of hybrid they are, are either just flat out wooden ships. They might also be wooden hulled ironclads. And even the ironclads had wooden decking. So whilst the sails catching fire might be something of an issue, you don't want hot embers coming down on your crew the powder that might be servicing the guns on the open decks or the deck itself and all the ropes and other things that are down there so it's in your interest to make sure as best you can that you don't just you don't get embers and so forth coming out of the funnels in the first place corvus asks range clocks and how they are used has been covered from time to time my question is, how were the hands moved? Did a seaman have to go up a ladder? Was it moved remotely from the plotting room or sheer will of the captain? Most range clocks worked by having, obviously, the range clocks up there. Then you can see they're attached to a tube. And then that tube would run down to the ship's bridge, um, whatever you happen to want to call it. But basically down there or at some other relevant portion of the ship's superstructure in a vertical column down unless it was a more advanced version where it could have a linkage that could run in all sorts of interesting directions there would be a mechanical link between a dial or a couple of dials depending on how many range clocks were up there where a person could then stand and that could I say that could be in the plotting room it could be on the bridge it could be wherever you wanted it to be and pretty much like a semaphore tower where somebody in a control room could set a semaphore signal and that would be mechanically amplified to change the big semaphore um, arms on the top of the tower. Similarly, on a range clock, you'd have a miniature version of the face and you'd have someone turn a dial to the or multiple dials to the relevant settings and through electromechanical linkages that would rotate the range clock arms to correspond with what the small face on in the control room said. Odd Engineering Questions asks, did anybody ever try to deal with the incredible amounts of salt in the Dead Sea and have warships or shipping on the Dead Sea? As far as I'm aware, nobody's ever really put any serious effort into shipping on the Dead Sea, partly because, well, the Dead Sea is dead. Nothing beyond microbial life survives in there, so there's no fishing industry there. Um, nobody lives on the edges of the Dead Sea, particularly, in any large settlements again because there's no reason to so there's no reason to control the dead sea particularly there's nothing particularly valuable around the edges of it and salt water the, well the salt water generally isn't nice to ships but the extreme concentrations of salinity in the dead sea really are not kind to organic materials long term so any ship you did put down back in the day would either be corroded away in the case of an iron vessel or in the case of a wooden vessel bad things would happen to it if you kept it in there long term and being well below sea level in kind of a natural depression there's actually also not a tremendous amount of wind so a sail powered vessel having to move through a relatively heavy brine anyway whilst that brine does horrible things to its hull you know it's not going to get very far and the sheer resistance of the dead sea would also make rowing through it an absolute pig so, yeah, there's not really any point. I think these days there are some tourist boats that go out there, but it's purely for touristy reasons, and I have no idea how they maintain their craft. Rodney Bacoy asks, If Germany and the high seas fleet had not been subjected to the restrictions of Versailles, but simply forced to comply with the Washington Treaty restrictions at the same tonnage as France and Italy, i.e. 175,000 tonnes, what might this German navy have looked like? Well, it depends how this is happening. You know, is Germany forced to reduce its navy massively and just told arbitrarily this is 175,000 tons, that's the maximum you can have, um, but it comes in with a moratorium at the time of the Washington Treaty, or are they told at the end of World War One 
you know, you can t choose 175,000 tons of capital ships and that's it. Um, because, you know, depending on exactly how you calculate the displacements, but if you play, if you, if you play fast and loose with the displacements, you might get either complete Saxon and Württemberg. This is an ideal circumstance for the Germans. So complete Saxon and Württemberg keep Bayern and Baden as well. So that gives you four battleships. And then you could have two of the Mackensons. Um, I mean, technically speaking, by most estimates, that would put you slightly over the 175,000 ton mark, but you could probably play around a little bit with the calculations and just about fit them in. So you'd have four battleships and two battle cruisers. A kind of middle case would be if to keep the two Bardens, um, two, the two Derflingers, that being Derflinger and Hindenburg, and then you could maybe squeeze a couple of Mackensons in the two most complete. Or if they were told, right, you can only pick from ships that you have at the moment, um, then two Derflingers, two Bardens, and two Koenigs put you with a little bit of a margin to spare, at least if you're, depending on exactly, again, how you calculate standard displacement. Um, so that would leave you some room for modification. So yeah, if they have to, if they're forced to keep to just stuff that they are um, already in possession of, it's going to be basic. the two best Koenigs, the two remaining Deflingers and two Bardens. And I suppose the flip side of that would be that if you allowed them to complete Saxon and Württemberg and kept two Deflingers but didn't let them keep any Mackensons, that actually is the one that gives you the closest to exactly 175,000 tons. Fletcher, Fletcher's fetching, Fletcher, Fletcher, Fletching, Fetcher, Fle Fetching, Fletcher's Fletcher, Fe Fletcher, Fletchings. Oh my word, there are two alliterative people in the Patreon these days. Asks, where did the ponderous nature of CSS Virginia come from? Was it her propulsion, heavy armor, ram bow? Was her hull meant for sail assisted steering? Or did her alter ego, Merrimack, have similar maneuverability? There were a number of factors involved. Firstly, yeah, Merrimack, along with most of the other long steam frigates was not the world's most agile vessel to start with let's be perfectly honest and that applies pretty much across the board because if you have a significantly high length to beam ratio you just don't become very agile um, secondly even though it, there was obviously an awful lot cut down from Merrimack but apart from anything that you know a lot of her above waterline stuff had burn, been burnt out once you'd piled in all this additional iron armor, the CSS Virginia actually outmassed Merrimack by about 800 tons. So it was roughly the same underwater hull form, but carrying more weight. And then on top of that, the refit to CSS Virginia significantly increased the ship's beam, which meant it was you know, presenting significantly more resistance to the water up front um, as it drove through it which also didn't help. Now, admittedly, that wasn't full depth beam. Uh, there was a fair bit of overhang involved, but it's still resistance, especially at the wind water line, which is quite bad. And all the and, and lesser factor was the fact because the ship was so low in the water, as you can see from this illustration, it meant that if you made any kind of significant headway and had any kind of bow wave or indeed were in any kind of rough seas, you'd have water coming over the top um, of the bow and pressing the ship down, which also slows the ship down and makes it more ponderous. So you've got a wider ship, which is presenting more resistance forward, that's also got more mass, which is uh, all trying to be turned by a rudder that was not designed to do this, whilst the water does its level best to push the ship down rather than allow the ship to push through it. Camino John asks, while watching another YouTube channel, Cutting Edge Engineering, the machinist was working on some induction hardened round, round bar stock, which he had to remove with a ceramic lathe to get at the softer steel inside. Curiosity got the better of me, and my research pointed out that you could harden up to 10 millimeter depth steel sheets, rods, bars, etc. My question is, would this have been of benefit to the various navies in World War II in terms of armour protection? I know it's not going to stop large calibre gunfire, but perhaps the performance characteristics would allow thinner plate steel to be used, thus saving weight. Perhaps steel on steel surfaces in machinery and so forth. Honestly, I don't think it's going to help too much in armour plate. 
because as you pointed out, it's not going to stop anything significant. And okay, whilst hardening up to 10 mil on plate might give things like, I don't know, um, you know, that sort of shallow depth hardening that might make things like gun shields, um, the, the mounts for various turrets, like secondary battery turrets, um, splinter shielding on the bridge and so forth that might make them a little bit more splinter proof a little bit more bullet resistant given that you're working with fairly thin steel at that point and it's quite marginal the level of protection that's being given i suspect if they had readily accessible induction heating or induction harden it well equipped for reduction heating which allowed them to have hard, hardened very thin sheets of steel I suspect they probably wouldn't have thinned the steel all that much, if at all. They probably just would have put a hardened face on it to give it just a little bit extra protection against bullets and shrapnel. So that's not going to save much weight. And once and the fact that you can only harden up to 10 mil thick would mean that on the thicker plates where you might want uh, layers of hardened steel, you're going to have to resort to more traditional methods, which at that point you're back to square one. You don't want to harden the outside of a lot of the steel, whether that be STS steel in the US, Ducol steel in the UK, etc., etc., because a lot of that is being used as structural steel which means it needs to flex a hardened face will mean it will crack or at least part of it will crack um so yeah i mean you could use it to harden the surface some surfaces in machinery that would be quite useful and it would improve the survivability of ships you know things like uh, the fletchers having splinter proof plating down their sides if you can add a little bit of hardness to that or as I said to bridges and gun mounts it'll keep more men alive it'll keep those things a little bit more durable but ultimately i don't think it's going to save a huge amount of weight just because of you know if you do harden the outer surface and then you shave off any significant amount of steel behind it enough to make a natural difference to the weight your overall level of protection is either the same or possibly has gone down and also um, with these relatively thin sheets of steel if you are going to harden them you do need some degree of softer backing in order to keep them intact to stop them cracking and shattering just in daily service and lastly for the first half of this patron dry dock leops 1984 asks assume that somehow it became necessary to produce steel armor of the thickness comparable to that which was used in battleships and assume that sufficient money is available Considering the current state of metallurgical knowledge and available facilities, would it be easier or more difficult to do it now, and would the results be significantly better than World War II armour? Well, assuming we're talking about face-hardened steel, whilst the living knowledge of how to actually do it may have gone away, for the most part, the documentation that various armour manufacturing companies will have had to, which you know tells you how they made face hardened steel that's still there so recreating the process assuming that money is no object could be done i mean you'd probably have to build an entirely new facility or heavily modify an existing one but it, it, yes it definitely could be done um considering our current state of metallurgical knowledge to be honest the metallurgical knowledge of today i don't think as long as you're using steel as your base I don't think that's actually going to cause a huge advance in the overall quality of the steel. You might, buying some sort of very clever chemical mixes with some of the more recently developed steels, you might get something that's a little bit better than World War II era face hardened steel armor from a material quality perspective. But unless you go off into some really weird stuff or just basically start using materials that are so different you might as well no longer call them steel it's good that's going to be a relatively marginal improvement you know in the order of you know it's not going to be double or anything like that it'll be within the order of a single digit or low double digit percentage points where you might well get significant improvement beyond that would be combining various things so your your overall quality of output assuming you're using now computerized tech uh, technology to do the hardening and the cooling etc 
that you're going to have a far more consistent output, both in terms of material quality and in the treatment. You're also going to be able to combine some of the tricks from various um, nations. So you'd be able to look at which processes produce the best quality steel, which would be one nation, then combine it with modern steel alloys, then combine that with the uh, additional so following the line of advances that the British and the Germans had made about what particular mixtures to use, combine that with the Italian method of varying the depth of the hardened face depending on the thickness of armour you're producing, combine that with the relatively consistent quality that the American yards uh, ship or the American steel yards at the time were able to produce, and all of a sudden you're getting an armour that, you know, even if you use the original British or German recipes, is probably still going to be a bit better than anything that was produced in World War Two. With and that, say, then you include the modern steel recipes. Plus, you can use computer aided simulations or calculations to work out exactly what the depth is you're going to need and how you could potentially apply certain methods of cooling using more specialist materials um, rather than just water sprays in order to ensure the best. Uh, kind of cooling at just the right pace with just the right transition and so on and so forth. So, I mean, the total amount of effort involved would be considerably more than what they put into in World War II. It's just an awful lot of it would be automated. And so for the end user, the human, it's once the initial setup is done, it'll probably be easier. It'll be a lot more expensive per tonne. But yeah, we, we could produce face-hardened battleship steel, assuming someone was willing to sign off on a massive budget, which would be appreciably better than what was made in World War II. But as I said before, it wouldn't be hugely better. It wouldn't be like, okay, well, we've now produced this face-hardened steel armor that is three times better than the best stuff ever produced in World War II. It would be, this is 25, 30% better if we're really lucky, something along those lines. And that's the end of part one. Roll on part two. <laughs>